Thank you very much. And on that note, we're going to uh, move on from, uh, from uh, topical questions to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 22635 in the name of Jean Freeman on the Baroness Cumberledge report. Could I invite all members who wish to ask a question on this matter to press their request to speak buttons? Uh, not, a, not to ask a question, sorry. Who wish to contribute? It's been so long since we had a debate that I've forgotten. Yes, no. Those members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I want to start by welcoming the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Report, the Cumberledge Report and the opportunity in this government debate today to discuss its findings and their implementation in Scotland. At the outset, I want to pay tribute to the many women in Scotland and across the UK who gave evidence to the review. This will have been a very difficult thing for them to do, and I want to put on record my admiration for their courage and determination and for their efforts in persistently raising issues over a number of years. To all those directly harmed by mesh, by sodium valproate and by Primodus, I want to offer the Scottish Government sincere apology. To them and also to those who have seen their children, their family members, their friends and colleagues suffer. The review and the recommendations are of significant importance to us as we work to improve how the healthcare system responds to harm. And I'm grateful to the review team not only for the work they've done, but for how they have done that work. I was pleased to be able to speak yesterday with Baroness Cumberledge and her team and hear from her the experience of the review's work, the thinking behind the recommendations and her determination to see these acted on. I was able to confirm to her this government's commitment to implement all of our recommendations where we have the power to do so and to support her in convincing the UK government to act on those recommendations that lie solely at their hand. I was also grateful for her recognition that much of the work we have underway is aligned to her recommendations. Let me turn now to set out our response to those recommendations. The Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review was uh, commissioned by a former UK Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. So there are recommendations which only the UK government with its reserved responsibilities can implement. The regulation of medicines and medical devices to, is reserved to the UK government. And so the recommendation that the MHRA be subject to substantial reform is for them to implement. But it is a recommendation I strongly support. We have long argued for reform in the assessment of medicine and medical device safety and have communicated directly with MHRA on this. We've been disappointed that they believe their assessment systems are fit for purpose. And I gave Baroness Cumberledge my assurance that we will use the avenues available to us to press the UK government to act positively and swiftly to review this body with patient safety at the heart. Similarly, the recommendations in relation to the General Medical Council will require consideration by that organisation, particularly around transparency of payments to clinicians and the expansion of the GMC's register. Here in Scotland, we have established a Declarations of Interest Steering Group, which aims to formulate a common set of principles for the identification and management of declarations of interest across NHS Scotland and related sectors, and is due to complete its work early next year. I hope that can help inform the response of the GMC. Turning now to recommendations three, four, and five, I absolutely understand that those who have suffered harm as a result of these treatments want redress. Not only financially, though I appreciate that is important, but also access to appropriate ongoing care that addresses the consequences of the harm experienced. That is both right and fair. I welcome the approach taken in seeing the redress agency as independent, funded in part by the pharmaceutical and medical device manufacturers and adopting a non-adversarial approach which looks to base determinations on avoidable harm through systemic failures. This is of critical importance and a recommendation we support. It is important not only for the individuals involved, but for the healthcare system as a whole. This approach will allow us to learn from the determinations of that body and apply that to improved patient safety. 
The review recommends the establishment of specialist centres. And as members know, we have invested 5.1 million over three years in a new complex pelvic mesh removal service in Glasgow, designated as a national service in July this year. The service will assess all of a woman's relevant health needs and subject to fully informed agreement, offer, offer vaginal mesh removal surgery for women over 16 who have mesh complications from mesh insertion vaginally or abdominally for urinary incontinence and prolapse. I will, yes. Neil Findlay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask um, how many mesh women have been involved in the co-production and co-design of that service? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I was just going on to that, but I can tell you that through the involvement of the Health and Social Care Alliance, that were actively involved in canvassing women's views and continue to do that work. Women have been involved in initially in the original design and will continue to be involved throughout. The specialist service follows directly from a recommendation by the Short Life Working Group on Mesh Complications, which has representation from the Health and Social Care Alliance, who, as I've just said, have been actively involved in canvassing women's views. The Short Life Working Group has and will continue to ensure that the views of women are central to the creation of the service in Glasgow. There will be a phased introduction this year, offering assessment and treating patients with complex needs with a clear patient pathway. The service is at an advanced stage of development and it is important that all those affected have access to high quality services now. This is a service that women themselves have asked for that through the alliance they've been involved and will continue to be involved in its design and is at an advanced stage. So knowing that, I cannot accept Neil Finlay's amendment, which asks us to stop that work. Importantly, a close working relationship is being developed with equivalent specialist centres in England and will be in place in, in a moment, will be in place as soon as those are established. This will provide an opportunity to support advancements in knowledge, techniques and practice and we intend will allow referral pathways outside of Scotland where that is the right thing to do for the patient and is what the patient wants. Yes, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you, Minister, again. There are a multitude of questions that need answered about this service and it's the women themselves who are asking it. They do not have faith in the way that the service is being brought up. I'm not asking for the service to be cancelled. I'm asking for it to be paused until all of those questions are answered and people can have faith in what is being built. Cabinet Secretary. So I accept absolutely what, the core of what Mr Finlay is saying in terms of the importance of women having faith in this specialist service. And undoubtedly, one of the um, harms that have been done is, is in terms of trust. And I completely accept that. But we do have women that the Alliance has canvassed and reached large numbers, many of whom have written to me, who want this service. Notwithstanding, there are questions that need to be answered, but I do not think it serves them well to pause the service, but rather to try and address all those questions while we continue to develop that work. I think it is entirely possible to do both hand in hand. The close working partnership between this service and the specialist centres in England will also allow for benchmarking and peer review, will help, I hope, to restore trust and confidence in our services, and as such, we are happy to accept Jackson Carlaw's amendment to the motion. In respect of other specialist centres, my senior officials recently met with patient groups, and we're currently considering whether additional centres or services would be helpful for those affected by sodium valproate and Primodus, in line with the other review recommendations. And as members know, we have established a million pound fund for women with mess complications. It opened to applications on the 1st of July, runs right through uh, to next year, and to date 276 applications have been received. The Cumberland Review makes an important recommendation on data, and members will be aware of concerns in this area expressed by patients to the Public Petitions Committee. The MHRA has been working on a sodium valproate valproate specific registry, the aims of which include monitoring the use of valproate in girls and women across the UK, compliance with the current regulatory position, and identify and monitor any children born to women taking that drug. 
In Scotland, we have also set up a Scottish Unique De Device Identifier Programme to develop a system for collecting data on implanted devices. And our aim is that the information we collect, particularly when combined with similar information collected elsewhere in the UK, will allow for better quality assurance, comparison and peer review. We've agreed to work with NHS Digital on a UK-wide database of procedures that they are establishing. We will join the pilot, which has an initial focus on pelvic floor procedures, including those using mesh and related procedures. In the longer term, DHS Digital ultimately intends to capture information on procedures concerning all surgical devices and implants from NHS and private providers. All of these are important drivers of change and continuous improvement, and a key aim of this programme is to support NHS Scotland's commitment to continuously improve patient safety. I will now turn to what I think is a key recommendation of Baroness Cumberledge's report, the appointment of an independent patient safety commissioner. It's clear to me, not just from her findings, but also from my own discussions with mesh injured women, families and professionals, that there is still work to be done to ensure that people are listened to, are heard, and their experiences acknowledged and valued. They should not be experiencing additional distress when what they need is further care and support. NHS Scotland carries the mantra, safe, effective and person-centred. I believe in that absolutely, but I also know that there is more for us to do to deliver on it. People must be at the centre of the decisions made about their care. We fully expect clinicians to facilitate shared decision-making listen to their patients' concerns and explain the risks and benefits of treatment options to allow them to make informed decisions. This is central to the principles of realistic medicine and should be fully embedded in the new specialist service for mesh complications. Indeed, when I met Baroness Cumberledge yesterday, she spoke at length about this. It is vital and it is why we agree with Alison John Johnson's amendment to the motion. It is vital for patients to have confidence that every time they access any part of the healthcare system, they will receive the information they need to make an informed decision and the best available treatment without fear of harm. By creating a culture of openness and learning, everyone should feel able to share what has gone well, but also what has gone wrong and what could have gone better. This helps us all to learn and to continually improve our services, our experiences, and the outcomes that we seek. The challenge is to make this a reality and to ensure that learning and improvement happens even when things go wrong. Now, whether through boards or through the public, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, there are established routes for patient feedback and complaint, but these are largely reactive and it is clear that not everyone gets the outcome they're looking for and not everyone feels they have been properly listened to or that change will come from their feedback. As a result, relationships between patients and health and care providers break down, with patients losing faith in the service. This needs to be addressed, and that is why establishing the Patient Safety Commissioner role for Scotland is now a programme for government commitment. The role will initially focus on improvements to patient safety around the use of medicines and medical devices, as set out in the review. The role must be proactive and enhance what we already have in place with the emphasis on listening to and learning from people's experiences and driving implementation to continually improve patient safety. To get this right and make it work for patients, we need to listen to them. So we will shortly begin a consultation to understand what patients want from this new role and then to act to implement it as soon as possible. I am anxious that we do not delay in this area. Presiding officer, I hope what I have set out today makes it abundantly clear that we take the findings of Baroness Cumberledge's report seriously. While there is a great deal of alignment between our thinking and our actions to date, her report gives us the opportunity and arguably the impetus to go further. As we draw together our implementation steps, I am pleased that Baroness Cumberledge has accepted my invitation to offer advice to me on our delivery plan and has accepted my offer to support her as she seeks to ensure that the governments of all four nations implement her recommendations. 
As we move forward with this, putting in place the detail and particularly the consultation on the Patient Safety Commissioner, I would be very happy to keep all members advised of our progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I call Donald Cameron to open for the Conservatives. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by referring to my register of interest in terms of health technologies? Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to open for the Scottish Conservatives today, and I will start by moving the amendment in Jackson Carlow's name. Now, I recognise that the thorough and rigorous report by Baroness Cumberledge covers a wide variety of cases and issues, and I hope to cover some of these. Um, however, I want to begin my remarks by focusing on the issue of polypropylene uh, mesh implants. The report was thorough on this matter, and it is very clear from the often harrowing accounts from victims of mesh implants that swifter action should have been taken when concerns were first raised. And it is with that in mind that I would like to start by paying tribute to several people who have been at the forefront of campaigning on this issue. First and foremost, I want to pay tribute to the many women who have campaigned and lobbied both this Parliament and the Scottish Government on the issue of mesh implants. Ever since I was elected an MSP in 2016, the passion and persistence of these campaigners has been obvious to me and indeed anyone involved in politics in Scotland. And in particular, I want to note the efforts of Elaine Holmes and Olive McIlroy, who first raised the matter with Parliament through the Public Petitions Committee back in 2014. Armed with over 1,700 petition signatures, their efforts and determination from that point onwards, alongside the words of countless others, have helped not only to deliver substantial change, but they have played a critical role in events which led to the development of this report. And as Baroness Cumberledge herself noted, the Scottish women and their evidence played a substantial role. And my hope is that Scotland will adopt many uh, sorry, will adopt my recommendations and ensure patients are listened to. I also want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to three MSPs who are in this chamber and whose contribution should be recognised and who will no doubt speak later in this debate. Firstly, my colleague Jackson Carlaw. As our health spokesperson in 2014, he met with the campaigners and took up this issue on numerous occasions in the Scottish Parliament and took evidence while on the Public Petitions Committee he has been a champion for the many women who have been affected by mesh implants and has continued campaigning on the subject even when it has been out of the public glare. I would also like to pay tribute to two other people who have played a critical role in securing change. Neil Finlay and Alec Neil, who have been powerful advocates for women affected by mesh in different ways. Neil Finlay has been a potent voice in this chamber and outside this chamber for those women and has not shied away from robustly holding the Scottish Government to account when it has dragged its heels. And Alec Neil, who was the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing when Elaine Holmes and Olive McIlroy's petition first came to the Parliament, was the one who listened to campaigners and requested a suspension in the use of mesh implants by the NHS in Scotland pending safety investigations. Of course. Neil Finlay. Is it an indication of the extent of this scandal that when Alec Neil did implement a suspension, health boards continued to implant another thousand women. That's how much the medical establishment took heed of a cabinet secretary telling them not to implant. Donald Cameron. Well, I uh, accept that, that there were issues uh, around that, but the point I was making was that when three different MSPs from different political parties get together to play a role in getting to the point that we are at now, it is a fine example of political differences being put to one side for the greater good in pursuance of such an important cause. And I also want to note that while this report is very overarching and clearly exposes significant system-wide failures, it is true to say that there are many clinicians who do an excellent job and who are respectful of their patients and want the best outcomes for them. Turning now, Deputy Presiding Officer, to the substance of the report, that report was, of course, commissioned by the former UK Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, and its recommendations are primarily focused on England. Baroness Cumberledge has called on Scotland to lead the way in implementing its recommendations where appropriate. And that is why those of us on these benches welcome the commitment in the programme for government repeated today to establish a patient safety commissioner 
as recommended in the report. And we will monitor this closely so as to ensure whoever is appointed to that role has the clear support of patients and campaigners because one of the recurring themes, and it's already been mentioned today, of the MESH scandal is the lack of confidence that affected women have in the system. Neil Finley spoke just earlier of faith in the system. I'm afraid to say there has been a history of kicking the can down the road and hoping this will go, to, go away. And when it comes to MESH, trust in the Scottish Government and those responsible in the health service needs to be revitalised. That is an urgent imperative. This should not be the moment when yet again this issue is yet again kicked into the long grass. If I know anything about the women who have campaigned so hard, they will not let that happen, and we will not let that happen. And while we note and welcome the recent announcements from the Scottish Government to provide additional support for patients, including the £1 million fund to support women with transvaginal mesh complications and the establishment of the National Mesh Removal Service, we will carefully scrutinise the efficacy of both these measures, taking into account the experiences and views of those who have suffered from mesh implants. But that should not be the end of the road. For instance, we remain concerned about the inability of the Scottish Government to secure the vital services of the mesh removal specialist surgeon, Dr. Veronikis. And it's clear that the wish and desire from patients' groups, including the Scottish mesh survivors, is that the expertise of Dr. Veronikis is secured. Indeed, the inability to secure his services was put bluntly in the Scottish Mesh Survivors' most recent submission to the Public Petitions Commission, where they said that, and I quote, losing out on this opportunity was not only shameful, it left Scotland's mesh-injured women devastated, terrified, and unwilling to use the service of the very surgeons who had not only implanted them with the mesh which destroyed their lives, but had also campaigned, but had also campaigned to continue using the implants long after evidence showed devastating lifelong injuries were being inflicted on upwards of 30% of patients. I will. I'm very grateful to the member for taking an intervention. Does the member acknowledge that as far as the Scottish Government is concerned and I as the Cabinet Secretary, the offer to Dr Verenaikis remains open, that the preconditions that he has set and has put down in black and white are preconditions that cannot be met and would not be met for any visiting clinician or surgeon of any standing, but that our, pre that our conditions that we require for patient safety are that, that he would come and that he had previously agreed to, that he would come, he would be part of our MDT process, he would advise us of what he needed, he would meet those that he would operate with, and then a contract of employment and subsequent GMC approval would be granted in short order. So I remain regretful that Dr. Verenaikis has withdrawn his offer, but our offer to him remains open. Point of order, Neil Finlay. President Officer, this, I have a letter that was sent to the Cabinet Secretary six days ago. She has made no reference to that in her comments so far. And I wonder if you would allow me to read an excerpt from it that would clarify exactly the position with Dr. Veronica. Mr. Finlay. Because, Mr. because Finlay, this is very important to this Mr. debate. Mr. Finlay, I can see from my list that you have been put forward by your own group to open in this debate. So that will be your opportunity to contribute however you wish to this debate. Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish mesh survivors were clear. They took a very firm view about his services and the need for him to uh, take action. Our amendment makes clear that the women who have had mesh implants and require removal surgery must be undertaken by surgeons who enjoy the full confidence of those women affected. That's the issue. It's about confidence. And that has to be fully funded by the NHS. It is no less than they deserve, and we hope that the Scottish Government recognise this and support our amendment. It is also worth remembering those with conditions other than pelvic uh, organ prolapse, POP, and stress urinary incontinence, who have suffered from mesh implants. At the end of 2018, the Sunday Post newspaper reported the stories of patients, male and female, who received mesh implants during hernia operations. One patient described the pain following that treatment as agonising and like being strangled from the inside. So it is clear that this particular form of material has had wide-ranging effects and caused untold damage 
to many lives. The report has been clear on the use of mesh to treat POP and SUI. And while it stops short of calling for an overall ban on its use, it says that women must be able to make a fully informed decision based on clear and unbiased information, the benefits, the risks, the alternatives, and doing nothing, and that mesh treatment should be considered as a last-line option after conservative non-surgical options and after consideration of non-mesh surgery. The report also covers two other significant areas of public health failings, namely the use of Primados and other hormone pregnancy tests and the use of sodium valparate for the treatment of epilepsy and bipolar disorder with emphasis on its effect during pregnancy. And while the report provides significant detail on both these cases, it is the personal experiences of those who suffer from these treatments that are the most sobering. These stories are heartbreaking, and they were just some of the many accounts that were noted in the report. Two of the key themes throughout many of these stories was the lack of information given to patients about the potential side effects of these treatments and the manner in which patients were ignored by clinicians when they raised their concerns. And they were not one-off failings or failings that could be attributed to a particular hospital or GP practice, but were instead indicative of a clear system-wide failure. And the report argues that the influence of patients within the NHS and the overall delivery of healthcare needs to be increased to balance the authority both directly and indirectly of those we call stakeholders in the system. And it notes the consequences of failing to listen to patients often leads to the patient feeling vulnerable and being unable to challenge and question. The patient is ignored and feels belittled. The patient voice dismissed, as the report terms it. That is a damning indictment. So it's clearly vital this improves, and hopefully the appointment of a patient safety commissioner can go some way to achieving that outcome. Presiding officer, in closing, I've merely scratched the surface of this detailed report, and I want to note these benches thanks to Baroness Cumberledge and her team for their tireless work in putting this together. It's clear that in Scotland, some immediate steps have already been taken, and we welcome and support those. But it must also be noted that in the case of the many women who continue to seek mesh removal treatment, that their fight continues. And in Scotland, we can make a difference if we have the resolve to do so. Thank you. Now call Neil Finlay to speak to and move amendment 2263.3. For up to eight minutes, please. Thanks, President Officer, and I'll uh, move the amendment in my name. I want to thank Baroness Cumberledge for her excellent report. It stands in stark contrast to the discredited sham of a review that was conducted in Scotland a few years back. It's taken eight years for a debate on MESH in government time. Despite this being one of the biggest medical scandals in the history of Scotland's NHS, every step of the way, ministers in the medical establishment have had to be dragged kicking and screaming to take action to support mesh injured women. And this is exactly the same for women who were victims of uh, sodium valprate and primados. They have had the same systematic cover-up, denial, manipulation of medical records, and vested interest protecting themselves and forgetting that their priority should always be patient care. Warm words and sympathy cut no ice with those who have lost their jobs, their homes, their life savings, their organs, their relationships, their ability to walk. Women who now use wheelchairs and walking aids have double incontinence, who live lives of chronic debil debility and pain, or whose children were born, eh, or their health, growth, or development so terribly affected. They don't need another clinician or a minister empathising with their plight. The wish mesh women already feel used by a first minister who, having ignored them for eight years, suddenly became desperate to meet them. I wonder if the fact that it was in the middle of a general election might have had something to do with it. Their words, their words, not mine. No, they demand action from a medical establishment that puts them first, not the vested interests of surgeons who implanted them or the manufacturers whose products maimed them. They need a care pathway that includes the right from, for them to have this poison removed from their body safely, if that is what they want. But that removal must only be undertaken by clinicians who know what they're doing. Ask any member today, would you trust a, a doctor whose recommendations and actions had wrecked your life to be the person to remove a product that is designed not to be removed from your body? I've seen the medical notes, as is the Cabinet Secretary, signed by senior clinicians stating, and I quote, a full or complete mesh removal has taken place. 
only for that same patient to have up to another 20 centimetres of mesh removed when they have had to fund themselves to go to the US to get treatment by Dr. Veronicus. What is the Cabinet Secretary and the GMC's view of these shocking cases? Are they medical errors or are they or are patients being misled? Jean Freeman. Does the member accept that in response to those situations, we have established an independent case review that will, with each of the women involved, independently using clini senior clinicians from out West Scotland, go through each of those cases with those women and then decide with them what further steps will be taken? But is the member saying that a surgeon who implants mesh cannot be a surgeon who removes mesh? No, no, no. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is... I'm asking, would we trust the same surgeon who had caused such devastation to our lives to be the people to remove it? I certainly wouldn't. And I know that half of the women who have responded in the survey have said they wouldn't either. Um, the Cumberland Report cites multiple systematic failings resulting in life-changing harm and makes nine recommendations. And I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed that they will implement all of those that they have the power to do so. That is a major step forward, and I welcome that. But I have to say, mesh injured women have huge questions about the new mesh service that's been established. None of the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group, none of them, have been involved in the Alliance project that I know of. And I'm receiving texts from them as, I, as we are speaking here. They question, who's going to staff this service? Will it be the same clinicians that women have lost all confidence in? I'm advised it will be. What removal techniques will be used? Will it be the same ones that have caused even more damage to some of the women who've already had partial mesh removals? What accredited training have those who will be staffing it had? The service evaluation handed to the First Minister in November 2019 confirms that all of the women who have had partial mesh removal surgery in Scotland continue to suffer chronic pain and that half surveyed did not undergo removal surgery because they do not trust the service. The service's own published research confirms that surgeons did not do total mesh removal, but they thought they had. They thought they had taken it all out and they hadn't. How can the service be allowed to carry out surgery when surgeons cannot do safe total removal and why did the lead clinicians fail to engage with Dr Veronicus when he offered help advice and learning and what happened to the patient information leaflet the decision making aid that was developed by Dr Agur and the Scottish mesh injured women it was sent to the first minister in 2019 in November and it's still not been introduced across the board a year later why are mesh injured patients been denied access to, their multi, to the multidisciplinary team meetings to discuss their health and their cases. They're being denied access to them. President officer, it's not for surgeons to tell women what they can and cannot have. Even if the clinician's preference is to leave an implant in, women must have autonomy of choice over what happens to their health and their body. And why have only a hand-picked few been involved in the service design. None of the Scottish mesh injured women from the group who've campaigned so vigorously here have been involved in that design. It's been a hand-picked few. This service is setting itself up to fail from the outset if it continues in the way it's, it has. And I, that would be a crying shame if that were allowed to happen. The development of the service has to be suspended at this point until all of these questions are asked, uh, answered. Sorry, And then we may be able to move forward. I'm pleading with the Cabinet Secretary, do not waste public money on this when there are so many questions hanging over this service. There are people out there desperate for help. They won't go under the current circumstances. President Officer, NHS guidance says that, and I quote, in very rare circumstances, consideration will be given to funding referrals to a highly specialist care provider in an internationally recognised unit overseas. This is a set of unique circumstances. 20 years of patients being abandoned by the system, an unprecedented scandal around implant and a implants and a failure to commission full safe removal. The First Minister and the Health Minister have recognised 
the very rare circumstances of this scandal. And they've recognised that international help was needed, hence the contact with Dr Veronicus. The Parliament, uh, the petition system and Alec Neill's follow-up suspended MESH and it remains in place. That is unprecedented also. And there's an unprecedented level of mistrust in the surgical community and what skills they may or may not have. They are entrenched in a legacy of a failure to adhere to the principles central to their oath. First, do no harm. This is a massive global female health scandal. And there's now only one credible option that respects the autonomy of the women, recognises the unique set of circumstances we're in, and will instill confidence in them. And that is to allow, without further delay, the NHS to finance travel abroad or within the UK, if that service can be found, for treatment of a surgeon of the, with a surgeon of their choice, their choice, autonomy. These women are heroes. They deserve nothing less. Finally, let us remember all those who have died too young of mesh-related illnesses, especially today Mrs Eileen Baxter, the first woman to have mesh identified on her death certificate as a contributory factor. God bless her and her family who continue to fight in her memory. I now call Alison Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 22635.2 for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I know that all in this chamber will wish to pay tribute to, to all affected by the failings in our health system as listed in the review. They did what their health service failed to. They supported each other and fought for years, sometimes decades, to have their stories heard. And I hope that this report has been the cause of some relief to them, but it should never have come to this. I'd like to focus on the issues I highlighted in my amendment. I should say that my amendment today is selected alongside amendments lodged by two of the three mesh -geteers. That's the name given to Neil Finlay, to Jackson Carlaw, and to Alex Neil by the Scottish mesh survivors. And the fact that these incredible campaigning women are still able to employ humour tells you so much about their spirit. And it shows too how very grateful they are to each of you for your consistent, ongoing, determined and vocal support. I think it's fair to say that few women would ever imagine that they'd be sharing their most intimate health problems with men who were neither physicians or partners. So I'd like to highlight on the, focus on the issues I highlighted in my amendment. We can't ignore the fact that the scandals examined in the review specifically affect women. His findings speak to a larger culture of silence around women's pain and discomfort. It shouldn't be news to anyone here that this pain is still being normalised and dismissed as women's problems. How many times have we discussed the stigma around periods and the menopause in this chamber? And yet the review highlights instances where women were told that their symptoms were just part of that time of life. Aside from the fact that this was obviously not the case, why are women continually expected to simply put up with dis Stressing symptoms because it's part of being a woman. When will women be listened to and, more importantly, believed? So it's clear to me after reading the review that the ways in which women are disadvantaged when accessing the health service played a significant part in these scandals. It states that the whole pharmaceutical and devices regulatory systems have been criticised as being suboptimal for women. And we also need to recognise how issues such as race intersect with this. Our 2019 report by Embrace UK found that black women were five times more likely than white women to die from complications associated with pregnancy. The risk for Asian and mixed race women were two and threefold respectively. So we need to acknowledge the barriers which all women face when accessing healthcare in Scotland. That's the key to ensuring women like the MESH survivors are never again forced to battle for years just to be heard. I, like many others, met the MESH survivors when they came to the Parliament in 2017. I will never forget meeting the MESH survivors in that small room on the ground floor, just off the garden lobby. The room was too small for those who had made the huge effort to come here to their Parliament to share those shockingly personal details with their representatives. A group of women who'd undergone surgery to address incontinence and found themselves requiring crutches and wheelchairs. One woman and her husband described her 24-hour day incontinence. I cannot imagine the impact this will have had on their lives, not to 
not only in terms of physical limitations, but their independence, their mental health, their self-esteem, their self-confidence. And, you know, like other colleagues here, I met women who'd been forced to leave their, their jobs, really important jobs. Women who could no longer look after the loved one, the woman who was heartbroken, she could no longer lift her grandchildren up. So women of different ages and backgrounds who bandied together and supported one another at a time of great physical and mental distress. Their persistence and bravery are truly awe-inspiring, but they should never have had to fight this battle, and it certainly shouldn't have taken this long. The MESH survivors have had to deal with unimaginable pain, loss of career, income, and impacts on family relationships. But imagine having to campaign relentlessly at a time when your focus should be solely on your health. So I'm sure we're all agreed that no one should ever again have to go to such lengths to be listened to. And that every woman affected should have access to the support and treatment required to bring about the most optimal health outcome possible. So we do need a complex, a complex mesh removal surgical service for women experiencing complications following vaginal mesh implants. Given the trauma that these women have experienced as a result of their pain and their struggle to be listened to, psychological support has to be an important part of this service too. However, there must be a rebuilding of trust between the women affected and the health service. Many will understandably be very wary of being treated by the same clinicians who implant, implanted mesh in the first instance. Yes. And quickly, please, Neil. Thanks Henry. for taking an intervention. Um, I wonder if she would uh, accept that, uh, given the pressure for a suspension has come from the women themselves, uh, to pause before this service moves on any further and those questions are answered, whether she thinks that's a wise thing. Alison Johnson. Yeah, I think many questions regarding the service remain, and I have some sympathy um, with the suggestion that there should be a temporary suspension to ensure that there is trust and confidence in any service. Now, the review notes that some mesh survivors have so lost faith in the NHS provision for mesh removal that they've been prepared to pay for expensive private surgery. In some cases, they've travelled overseas at great cost, both personal and financial. No one should have to do this, and of course, this isn't an option for everyone. People mustn't feel so let down by a healthcare system that they've got no option but to pay for their care. So this rebuilding of trust has to be prioritised. The review makes clear that its findings weren't the result of a handful of bad apples. It states that the issue here isn't one of a single or a few rogue medical practitioners or differences in regional practice. It is system-wide. We have a chronic problem whereby women aren't listened to, but also where a fear of retribution can prevent clinicians from coming forward when mistakes are made. I will close there, uh, presiding officer. Um, I would like to move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton for up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also recognise the work of Jackson Carlo, Neil Finlay and Alex Neil in this? It's really spanned my entire career in Parliament and it has been awe-inspiring. I welcome the opportunity to debate the findings of the Cumberland Review. Uh, and the stories told by patients are of debilitating, uh, debilitating pain with life-changing consequences. And the thing that links all of these cases is a level of acute suffering that could have been avoided. And that truly is a public health disaster. What is common with all three of the medical interventions examined in this review is that the patients, by and large, were always nearly women, and in a lot of cases, they were, uh, those interventions were linked to their pregnancies. The fact that their chronic symptoms were dismissed for so long as so-called women's problems is scandalous and a hor horrific example of gender inequality. When we look back at the last few decades and how many lives have been wrecked by these interventions, it's a matter of national shame. Nothing can undo the damage other than apology, compensation, corrective surgery, and psychological support. Thousands of women who took the drug uh, Primodos, um, their children are, have been born with disabilities, sometimes painful disabilities, and they are now adults. There is no doubt in my mind that uh, the redress needs to be significant for all cases in this review. And this compensation should come from the UK government, but also the regulatory bodies uh, who failed these women, as well as the German drug company Bayer, who need to accept some responsibility for this. They knew it was harmful in the 60s, but carried on marketing it, making a profit from it. It's outrageous that they continue to deny the link between the drug and the disabilities. My former colleague in Westminster, Norman Lamb, uh, called on the use of sodium valp valparate during 
during pregnancy in the 1970s is an extraordinary scandal. There are an estimated 20,000 children also now all adults who have been left with disabilities as a result. Um, what is even more painful for mothers is that it was a drug often used to treat mild seizures that they would certainly never have taken had they been fully informed about the potential side effects for their babies. But it is on the issue of MESH that has united this parliament this afternoon, and I want to focus the remainder of my remarks. I welcome the National Vaginal Mesh Removal Service that was launched last month, in particular the much needed psychological support alongside the £1.3 million fund. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary if she could answer in her closing remarks whether uh, patients will be able to choose their own surgeon for corrective surgery. I think it is an important point to make, and it was made by Neil Finlay, that many women do not have the confidence that the surgeon that originally did their injury uh, should be part of its solution. And I think we need to recognize that fear and anxiety. I also want to uh, be sure that they, if they need to travel outside of this country, then they will have the costs of so doing reimbursed to them by NHS Scotland. I raise the inter issue of international intervention because as we've heard, the US-based obstetrician, Dr. Veronikis, is a world leader in mesh removal surgery, and it is hugely regretful that he has withdrawn his offer to come to Scotland following difficulties and delays in arranging the village visit. I do recognize uh, from the cabinet secretary that that offer is still open. I hope very much that he will come here and train surgeons to carry out the corrective surgery, because that's absolutely fundamental in doing right by these patients. Um, Alison Johnson, men, uh, mentioned in very um, eloquent terms the visit that she and I both attended, organised by Neil Finlay of the MESH Survivors Group in the ground floor room in the Scottish Parliament. That, that visit will stay with me for the re remainder of my parliamentary career and probably for the rest of my life. Many of those women were in wheelchairs and uh, in abject pain as well, sometimes very, finding it very difficult to move in any way. And I found their dignity and their strength utterly, utterly inspiring. And it prompted me to hold a, a members debate later that year uh, on the need for a national continent strategy, because all too often MESH was used as a quick fix for continent, incontinence issues. And I think that we should, as a country, be, be far more proactive in encouraging women and men to talk about um, when they leak, the fact that humans naturally do leak, the majority of us will do at some point, but that's okay. And there are easy ways of fixing that with proper pelvic floor physiotherapy, um, rather than the insertion of potentially devastating implants as we see all too often used. And, they should, and, and were they pharmaceutical pro products may never have even made it out of trial phase given the impact and physical injury we know that they can cause. So while this uh, report rightly focuses on transvaginal mesh, because that is where the majority of these mesh survivors um, have had their implants, I would like to remind the chamber that of the forgotten survivors, and it was a point I think rightly made by Donald Cameron when he pointed out those who have uh, suffered mesh surgery uh, to fix hernias. The, the pause on surgery does not apply for those operations. They receive little or very little recognition um, and no corrective surgery and certainly no financial payout. I cannot see uh, why they are discounted from this. Cabinet Secretary will remember I have previously raised with her the case of my constituent, Leslie Hughes. Um, Leslie underwent mesh surgery to help relieve pain around her groin hernia in 2017. After the mesh was implanted, she found herself in even worse pain. It was so bad, she could not move at all, had to rely on a walking stick or even a wheelchair as the pain was so unmanageable. She found it tricky to return to work. And Leslie traveled to London in October 2018 to have the mesh removed privately rather than on our NHS. And although helped, it helped the pain and mobility, she still has chronic fatigue, pain, migraine, and reduced mobility. She is now saving money to buy a scooter. She has been financially hit because she's had to reduce her hours of work, and she's been un physically unable to work full time. She was offered the removal surgery from the NHS, but she paid surgically uh, for the surgery privately because she told me that she had no trust or evidence of good practice from the surgeon she was assigned and uh, was not willing to risk the uh, matters being worse. I can see my time coming to end. I would just like to close by thanking once again all of those MESH survivors, assuring the movers of all amendments from all parties today that we'll be supporting all of you. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate. Thank you. We now move to, to the open debate. Can, can I say we're already way over time this afternoon. Later contributions may have to be curtailed, but meanwhile, speeches of up to six minutes, please. Alec Neil, followed by Brian Whittle. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say there are very few issues in this Parliament that unite all five parties, but I think all the three issues addressed by the Cumberland's report actually adds to that total significantly today. And I too would like to pay tribute to Lady Cumberledge and her team for a first class report on all three areas in which they looked into, although I'll be concentrating obviously on the mesh issue. And there are a number of points I would like to make to take us forward, presiding officer. Uh, first of all, can I very much welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to create a Scottish a patient safety commissioner. I think this is long overdue and it is a huge, a, it could be a huge advantage for people who find themselves in the position that the MESH women found themselves in many years ago. Uh, in considering and taking forward the consultation on the creation of this post, I would like to make three or four suggestions for consideration by the Cabinet Secretary and by the Government. The first thing I would say is to maximise the impact and the confidence on such an appointment. I think we should follow the example, example of the Ombudsman and make this a parliamentary appointment, not an appointment by the Scottish Government or the National Health Service. I think to maximise the confidence, this has to be someone who is not seen to be part of the internal system uh, where the problems arise in the first place. Secondly, I think it has to have a wide remit uh, and not be so narrow that it becomes ineffectual. And thirdly, it has to have powers. I think one of the shortfallings of the Ombudsman is that at the end of the day, the powers the Ombudsman has to implement the recommendations is extremely limited. Uh, this thing has got to have teeth and the power to rectify mistakes before they're made, let alone once they're made. And the other suggestion I would have is let's not make the same mistake we did with the Scottish Human Rights Commission and disallow it from investigating individual cases. I would see this commissioner being able to look at generic issues around patient safety as well as investigate individual cases. And I think if those powers, that remit, and that status as a parliamentary commissioner are awarded to this position, then we'll have a very strong patient safety commissioner, and that is what we are looking for. The second point I want to emphasise is this. Uh, I very much agree with uh, the Cabinet Secretary's motion, but I very much agree with Jackson Carlaw's motion, where he says that the Parliament, uh, proposing that the Parliament believes that the actions taken by the Scottish Government should include the early prospect of full transvaginal mesh removal surgery being undertaken by surgeons who enjoy the full confidence of the women affected, uh, affected and fully funded by the NHS. And I think the Cabinet Secretary, from her remarks, has said that she agrees with that. I think this is fundamental to the basic principle that the patient comes first. And I particularly welcome, as part of the mesh removal service, the individual case reviews where the patient, along with the relevant consultant uh, or medics, take the joint decision about the best for that individual patient. None of us are qualified, indeed no one else is qualified to tell a patient which is what's best for them, other than the patient in consultation with their doctor. Can I just finish this point then? But can I make the very fundamental point is, we do know, although we don't know the numbers, and, and we don't know the individual complexities, nor should we, the reality is there will be a significant number of women who will reach the conclusion, have reached the conclusion, that the only person on the planet who can safely remove their mesh is Dr. Veronicus in America. Now, I'm not going to get into who said what, when, why Dr. Veronicus is no here, or why we are no there. I'm not interested in that primarily. I just want us to get to the position that those women who need their mesh removed by Dr. Veronicus and see that as the only solution for them, that those women, one way or another, get access to the services of Dr. Veronicus to, re to remove their mesh. 
I believe that we owe it to these women to make sure that happens. The National Health Service in Scotland, and indeed in the rest of the UK, has a tradition of sending people abroad for any procedure that cannot be safely carried out in our own country. This is not new. What's new probably here is the potential scale on, what, on, on which we need to do this. And I think we've just got to, as a parliament, as a government, as a society, we need to take it on the chin that we owe it to these women and we have to foot the bill for the women who, uh, whose only solution is to go to the States and have the mesh removed by Dr. Veronicus. And I think that is the most important aspect, actually, in the short term of today's debate, uh, because we cannot allow, uh, we cannot allow the lives of these women to be destroyed by the failure to remove the mesh that probably in many cases should never have been inserted, or certainly not inserted the way it was into their bodies in the first place. Will you close the third, now, please? The, the final point I would make, uh, presiding officer, is in relation to the patient decision aid, which I think should be used much more widely, and to ensure, although the MHRA reform is a reserved matter, we want to ensure that all the devolved governments are heavily involved in the decision-making and the process of reform to make sure that we rectify that organisation and never again should any manufacturer be able to destroy people's lives in the way in which mesh manufacturers have done over the last 10 or 20 years. Ryan Whittle to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by pointing members uh, to my register of interest and specifically my interest in healthcare technologies? Now, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate uh, regarding uh, the Baroness Cumberland's report. This is not the first time uh, this chamber has debated the issue of polypropylene mesh implants and the devastating impacts that their use has had on so many patients who have undergone that procedure. My remarks will be uh, towards that because when I was a member of the Petitions Committee, it will be hard to forget the harrowing evidence session we took with the Cabinet Secretary and the CMO. And when, when, I'm, even long, when I'm outside this place, that will not leave me. I can still vividly picture the discomfort of those giving evidence with so many of the sufferers, many in wheelchairs, sitting behind them, reacting to every question and every answer. And the discomfort of those giving evidence was because there's little that could be said to justify why more had not been done to alleviate, alleviate the suffering of so many and prevent future suffering. Actions that could and should be taken swiftly that just hadn't been implemented. And, and reality was, I don't think there was any ex ex excuses. I mean, I would also pay tribute to those who have campaigned and lobbied so passionately. And I mentioned, and others have, Elaine Holmes, and all of McElroy specifically for bringing the petition to Parliament in 2014. As has been mentioned by other speakers, MSPs from across the chamber have been instrumental in keeping this travesty on the agenda. Jackson Carlaw, Neil Finlay, Alex Neil all joined members of the committee for every evidence session of that petitions committee when MESH was on the agenda and were vociferous in their cross-examination of the witnesses. Now, there has been undoubted progress but I think the journey is far from over, which is why I asked the Chamber to support the Scottish Conservative Amendment in the name of Jackson Carlaw, which would require that removal surgery must be undertaken by surgeons who enjoy that full confidence of patients undergoing this procedure, and that it has to be fully funded by the NHS. And I think Alec Neil spoke uh, very well to that point. Surely this is the least that these women can expect. And the Scottish Government, I think, also must, uh, uh, again, try and secure the, the services of the mess removal uh, specialist, Dr. Veronicus. And I think it is baffling to the campaigners that this has not already been done. Now, let's remember, this petition was brought to Parliament in 2014, six years ago. In that time, we have heard how, may, how the then Cabinet Secretary for Health, Alex Neil, called for that monitorium on the use of mesh across Scotland's health board, believing that this would halt the use of that procedure while further evidence was taken. And I know he was as shocked as we were to find out that that monitorium was not binding 
and several health boards continued with the procedure regardless. And I think this is definitely a lesson uh, for this Parliament. So when a Cabinet Secretary makes what was undeniably the right decision to protect public health and is unaware that his decision can be overruled without his knowledge. And I thought it rather poignant when the report we were discussing was entitled First Do No Harm, considering the way in which this and other treatments in this report have been deployed. As my colleague Donald Cameron said in his opening address, the report falls short of recommending an outright ban on the use of mesh implants, but does suggest that their use be a last resort treatment only after uh, other, other treatments have been fully explored. Furthermore, and just as importantly, is the way in which the patient is engaged with any adverse event review, and that has to change. Something I've raised in this chamber many times in relation to other events, such as uh, childbirth uh, mortality. I think the Patient Safety Commissioner would seem a very logical way to promote the importance of listening to and learning from patient experiences, and it's good to hear the Scottish Government's commitment to that. Furthermore, the, the report highlights the need for a substantial review of the MHRA, which I have to say, in their engagement with the Petitions Committee, were far from satisfactory, and I look forward to that happening. The other recommendations that is raised in the report is, is a call for a, a central patient identifier database that collects key details of the implementation of all devices at the time of operation. The issue of accessible data in healthcare is something that I realise the Chamber will know I have called for on many occasions. The development of an IT platform that enables the use of accessible data in developing healthcare, I think is absolutely necessary if we're going to make significant progress. We are behind the curve which makes mistakes such as this harder to identify and longer to investigate when they are identified. This Deputy Protecting Officer is a prerequisite to so many of the issues that face our healthcare system. Deputy Protecting Officers, in many, way, in many ways Scotland has been at the forefront of the drive to change the way in which MESH is presented to patients as a solution. The petitioners have been at the forefront of that drive. However, I think it's fair to say the Scottish Government have been a little bit lethargic at best. I think it's worth pointing out that there have been three Cabinet Secretaries for Health in that time. From the point when Alex Neil took the, what looked like decisive action in calling for that moratorium on the procedure, there seems to have been a reluctance by the Scottish Government to respond with any urgency. Six years is too long, Deputy Presiding Officer, and after all, Mr. Whittle's just, just closing. closing up. Six years is too long, Deputy Presiding Officer. And after all, if the COVID crisis has taught us anything, it is if there is a will to move, it can be done swiftly. It's time that those who have campaigned and those who have suffered get to the end of their journey. And I urge the Chamber, therefore, to support the Scottish Conservative Amendment in the name of Jackson Carlaw, Deputy Presiding Officer. Kenneth Gibson, followed by David Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I also wish to put on record my appreciation of the hard work and tenacity of Jackson Carlaw, Neil Finlay and Alex Neil on the important issue of transvaginal mesh implants and, of course, those who have campaigned for this from outside this place over many years. The Scottish Government has been quick to respond to the Cumberland report demonstrating its continued commitment to women's health during this COVID-19 pandemic. And the Cabinet Secretary has taken measures to support women with mesh, complica mesh complications, including provision of a £1 million support fund and set up the complex mesh removal service, supported by more than £1.3 million of Scottish Government funding. However, this must involve patient choice. Following the establishment of the West of Scotland Endometriosis Unit last year, this will be another step to help women in the West of Scotland uh, and beyond. And I furthermore look forward to a patient safety commissioner becoming a national advocate for patients. And I concur with my colleague Alec Neill that such a commissioner um, should be appointed by this parliament and indeed I share his views on the remit and powers of the commissioner. One doesn't have to be female to know that women and girls can suffer from a multitude of conditions that are truly life-changing and harrowing every single day. Many women have been encouraged by society to feel that like they just have to go on with it, not because they want to be hard on themselves or trivialise their own situation, but because some males have trivialised often very distressing conditions uh, and concentrating on other things is the only way for some women to get through the day. And when it comes to the impact of medically induced conditions on either the women or our loved ones, physical pain is often exacerbated by an unwarranted feeling of guilt. 
I'm sure many members across the chamber have listened and spoken to women who feel guilty about taking medication that led to birth defects, for example. And while the love for a child doesn't change, the notion that a child's life would have been different if they hadn't taken Primodos or sodium, sodium valproate, the negative impact of which they did not know, must be unimaginably difficult. None of these women are to blame. They trusted medicine and their doctors and only took what, to, to their knowledge at the time, was the best course of action. In the review, Baroness Cumberledge and her panel met over 700 people across the UK, mostly women, often accompanied by partners, other family members, and sometimes their children. It can't have been easy for participants to open up about something so painful and personal, but they did it to help others, and I admire them greatly for it. The Baroness states in a report that she was particularly impressed with developments of the pelvic mesh patient decision aid by NHS Ayrshire Nam, together with patients. The PDA assists patients with decision-making as to whether or not to have surgery with a focus on understanding the potential short, medium and long-term outcomes that matter to the patient. Every decision to have anything implanted in your body should be made with all information available as should one to remove it. On the back of this innovative uh, Ayrshire uh, project, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, uh, Care Excellence developed their own PDA. Side effects of medical treatment are accepted to a degree but when something has a major impact, it's not acceptable to gloss over that, and this is why it's so important to have proper systems in place. I'm a member and former convener of the cross party group on epilepsy, and of course, sodium valproate has been a regular topic of discussion over the years. Well, I'm aware that it is much less prevalent than pelvic mesh complications are, how this is being dealt with provides an interesting insight into how we gather data and empower patients further in their own decision making as to what treatment they are and are not unwell they are and, are and are not unwilling to undertake. The onus on making sure patients are provided with all relevant information obviously lies with healthcare professionals. If a woman on sodium valproate falls pregnant, there's a 10% chance the child will have a physical defect and 30 to 40% chance the child will have developmental issues. For a woman of childbearing age to be prescribed sodium valproate, they have to be seen by an epilepsy specialist, get effective contraception and be seen on an annual basis. Like other health boards, NHS Ayrshire Nairn in 2017 immediately implemented NHS Scotland's advice that sodium valproate should not be used uh, by women of childbearing age or pregnant women unless other treatments are ineffective or not tolerated, and should only, this should only be prescribed by a specialist. If sodium valproate is the only effective option for a woman of childbearing age, she must always be given effective contraception, or at least the choice thereof. In 2014, the EU Medicines Agency advised that clinicians must be more aware of the impact of sodium valproate, which led to the MHRA advice in 2018 that it couldn't be prescribed to women of childbearing age unless they were compliant with the PREVENT programme. Some GPs now no longer prescribe uh, sodium valproate to any patients, meaning some who might benefit from this epilepsy drug don't get it. Last September, at the cross-party group on epilepsy, Dr Ian Morrison, consultant neurologist at NHS Tayside, described how helpful gathering data for a national epilepsy register can be for such purposes, allowing clinicians to see how many patients have been prescribed sodium valproate, who was female, their age, and then contact them directly. Without the database, this would have taken weeks, if not months. Many patients didn't want to switch from sodium valproate, having achieved seizure freedom, and had, they had no desire to extend to their family or in a same-sex relationship. Only two came to the clinic because they considered starting a family. This seems like an effective way to create awareness amongst patients as their own personal circumstances might change while they are on medication, and yet others can still benefit from the drug uh, as an epilepsy treatment. A similar register is currently being piloted by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Personalised support calls by Epilepsy Scotland's Chief Executive Leslie Young to make it a national register rather than health a health board based one. Presiding officer, I look forward to seeing further progress as soon as possible and urge the Scottish Government and our health boards to do what is necessary to keep patients and their families safe, whether from Soviet, uh, the inappropriate use of sodium valproate or mesh implants. David Stewart to be followed by Claire Adams. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding officer. And my view is that one of the great strengths of this parliament is when members across the political divide unite in common cause to achieve a shared goal. In the past, this has been illustrated by campaigns to achieve free personal care in international development and animal welfare. But the campaign to support the women who have faced the physical and psychological harm from mesh implants is a prime example of my theme today. And I would echo Donald Cameron and indeed other uh, colleagues 
who have praised the work of Neil Finlay, uh, Jackson Carlo and Alec Neil. They really do deserve praise and congratulations for their unswerving support and dedication to this campaign. I still remember, presiding officer, the first time I met the MESC campaigners. I was uh, a fresh-faced, newly minted convener of the Petitions Committee. In advance of the hearing, I had thoroughly read and absorbed the brief and the petition, but nothing prepared me for the submission by the MESH, MESH campaigners. Many of the petitioners were in tears as they entered the committee room. Some were in wheelchairs, others were in obvious pain. The lead campaigner said to me that the MESH devices had gone from gold standard to no standard. They spoke of the serious complications, the chronic pain, the infections, the reduced mobility, the sexual difficulties, the autoimmune diseases, the psychological strain and the incontinence. And in my four or so years as the convener, it was the most powerful, vivid and frankly upsetting meeting that I've ever witnessed. This, of course, has been echoed in the Cambridge Review when a patient was quoted as follows. My journey to find a surgeon who believed that my current health situation is down to mess complications is traipsing through treacle. And I think the GMC briefing to us today made a very pertinent point when they argue that the harrowing experiences of patients as drawn out in the Cumberland Review are the stark reminder of the life-changing harm that mesh implants can cause. It's clear to me that patients on both sides of the border have felt ignored, and that's not acceptable in a modern, fit-for-purpose national health service. Now, President Officer, it's easy for health bureaucrats to wax lyrically about shared decision-making and informed consent, but clearly this broke down in the MESH scandal. And I welcome the fact that the GMC have commissioned independent research on the subject which should improve practice in the future. I also thought it was interesting that the Cumberland Review itself is subtitled, as others have mentioned, First Do No Harm, which, as members will all know, is contemporary parlance expressing the underlying ethical rules of modern medicine. Uh, but those of you who were off uh, that day, classically, of course, that was taken from the ancient Greek Hippocratic Oath, uh, which is obviously fundamental uh, to the work that doctors and others do. So the thrust of the report is perhaps summarised in the following brief quote from the report itself. We have found that the healthcare systems, of which I include the NHS, the private providers, the regulators, the professional bodies, pharmaceutical and device manufacturers and policymakers, is disjointed, siloed, unresponsive and defensive. The general findings make for depressing reading and other members, presiding officer, have mentioned these already, the general systematic failings resulting in life-changing harm, patients ignored, a culture of denial, manufacturers motivated by profit, speed to market and returns to shareholders rather than patient safety, a case of checking the purse before the pulse. But there was a strong and well-argued set of recommendations, the apology to patients, patient safety commissioner, independent redress agency, ex gratia payments and a network of specialist centres to provide treatment, care and advice for those affected and of course a mess registry. Now I do accept, presiding officer, the Scottish Government has implemented a number of these recommendations but what about the others? So in conclusion, presiding officer, so I'm conscious of time this afternoon, I, like others, will not forget the day I spent with the mess campaigners, their pain, their sorrow, their psychological strain, the reduced mobility, their serious complications, all avoidable. Now, scandal is a word that's often misused, but in my mind, it's not misused today, not in connection with this valiant and steadfast group. So I recommend and I commend the work of the MESH campaigners. Let's implement all the recommendations that are relevant of the Cumberledge report, and let's right a wrong that's for far too long been a stain on our NHS. Thank you for your brevity, Mr Stewart. Claire Adamson to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank um, Baroness Cumberledge and all those who contributed to this really important report. And also as someone who met with the women in 2017 uh, in the event organised by Neil Finlay um, to, to pay tribute to their courage, their determination and their tenacity in making sure that this issue um, was um, given the full exposure that it so rightly deserved. The report does cover three important areas in terms of the um, hormone pregnancy tests and sodium val valparate, but 
the, the area that I want to, to, to look at in particular, um, as many people have this afternoon, is in the pelvic, pelvic mesh implants and what that has, um, ha what the consequences have of that have been for many, many patients in, in this country. And I stand back and ask, how, how is it possible that this could have gone on for so long and that the, the concerns raised and the voices of the women's had gone on ignored for such a long time? And I do think that um, it, it strikes of a bias in the medical professions, unintentional bias and it, or intentional bias, but there is a, a fundamental um, attitude that has to be challenged here. And I really do pay tribute to the women because if they hadn't been so tenacious and brought their voices forward and ensured that this report came to, to publication and that we are debating it today, that some of these issues would have gone unaddressed in our health services. In 2018, Serena Williams um, was very vocal about her experience uh, uh, giving birth to, to her child and, and what she saw as, as the complete lack of medical attention to her concerns during uh, childbirth. Um, and she was very, very seriously ill and suffering from thrombosis um, and virtually had to beg for the assistance she needed to save her life and the life of her child. And I think that brought to fore what was mentioned by Alison Johnson earlier on, is the, the, the amount of health inequalities and biases in our health service. In um, 2020, the um, Royal College of Gynaecologists, sorry, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists held a special International Women's Day event looking specifically at the issue of inequalities for BAME women and um, pointing out that in multiple layers of health care, it shows that how essential it is for action to be highlighting and addressed to tackle the disparities that are literally costing lives. The main focus of the work of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists Women's Network was to ensure that women's voices are heard, their views and their experiences are used to shape education guidance and policies around their care. In order to reduce the disparities, we must open up the debate and ensure women's voices are at the centre of it. And without the women's voices of the MESH survivors, we wouldn't be here today. I would like to talk about something that's already been raised by Alex Cole Hamilton and uh, Mr Cameron as well, and, and that is a, a someone who's forgotten in this, and it's one of my constituents who I won't mention by name, but I have her permission to talk about a case today. And it's one that I have written to the, the Health Se uh, Secretary about in the past. In 2008, my constituent um, suffered um, complications after um, a cesarean section and um, contracted a nosocomial infection that led to her requiring mesh implants to rebuild her abdominal wall. A very young woman at the time, um, but since, since then has, has exhibited the same pain and the discomfort and all of the complications that we've heard about today um, fr from um, the mesh that she believes has, has caused her, her issues with pain and terrible chronic pain at the moment. Um, has she repeatedly asks for joint gynecological um, and plastics consultations, repeatedly asked to be seen by a plastic surgeon. And, um, and although that is likely to happen now, she's been asking since 2008 and only now is getting in front of the medical professionals who can explain to her what has happened. She doesn't know how much mesh is in her body. She doesn't know where it is in her body particularly. She just knows that since she got that um, mesh put in, she's experienced unbelievable chronic pain. Um, she has made many requests for full medical records to be given, and only now has she, she got those, which hopefully will help her get some of the answers that she's been looking for. And while we continue to represent her in trying to alleviate these, this situation, um, unfortunately, in the current rules, she falls out with the very welcome uh, support that has been put in by the government for those who have, have suffered um, transvaginal um, pelvic um, measure. Um, yes, can no, Miss Adamson's just closing, actually. 
Sorry. Yeah, so, um, so this is someone, if my hope from what today is, is I hope that the appointment of a patient safety commissioner will ensure that no one is left behind who has been affected by these issues. And again, I commend all of those women who have fought so strongly to have their concerns recognised, listened to. If anything, this is about never, ever not listening to the patient voice, the voice of the women who have been affected by this. Thank you, President Officer. Annie Wells, followed by John McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the publication of this report, First Do No Harm, and the recommendations it makes. I would also like to place on record my thanks to Baroness Cumberledge and her team for their diligent work over the last two and a half years. And whilst the report is primarily focused on the NHS in England, there are clear implications for practices and procedures in Scotland, so I am pleased ministers are engaging with the substantive issues it identifies. <clears throat> However, the report makes for incredibly painful reading. It tells the story of women who went through treatments and were pro provided with medication that did not just harm them, but degraded the conditions in which they lived their lives. As the report puts it, we met so many women with limited mobility, having to rely on a wheelchair or crutches to move around unable to sit for periods at a time, unable to play with their children or carry their grandchildren, living daily with the consequences of the operations and procedures they thought would cure them. To go through an experience like that, but still be able to express it, speaks to an inner resilience that most of us would be lucky to have. I commend the bravery of those women who volunteered to speak up and share their truths. For without them, the real extent of the problem would have been obscured for some time to come. Now, it's also clear that there, were, there was a systematic belligerence on the part of those dealing with patient complaints. In a theme that runs throughout the investigation, patients were either not fully informed of the extent or possible side effects of their treatments or had their concerns written off and ignored. So we can't look at this as an issue around a few practices that have, for the most part, been stopped. The scale of the human cost demands more than an apology. The extent to which complaints and requests for information were mishandled means that the response has to be considered across both government and the NHS. The report sets out nine conclusions, and I am grateful that the Scottish Government has agreed to consider each with some action already being taken. I acknowledge that the Cabinet Secretary has apologised to the women affected and in line with the second recommendation, the programme for government commits to establishing a patient safety commissioner, and I hope it will be implemented as quickly as possible. Now, there are some recommendations that can be enacted by the Scottish Government without needing to look at action elsewhere in the UK. The fourth recommendation regarding separate schemes for additional treatment would be particularly helpful. Our amendment falls within this although I will discuss that at a later uh, detail later. Similarly, the fifth recommendation around the network of special centres for treatment and the seventh, which would improve the data available to audit treatment outcomes, could be actioned now. And I am sure all parties would work constructively on these if the government brought forward proposals forward. Yes. Minister. Thanks very much. I just wanted to uh, correct the member there. She said that we would consider the recommendations. The Scottish Government says we will implement the recommendations and we're accepting the Conservatives uh, Jackson Carlow's amendment to the Government um, motion. Um, so I'm sure the member will welcome that. But I wonder, in the spirit of cross-party working, will she work with her colleagues in Westminster and ask the UK Government to also accept these recommendations as Baroness Cumberledge has put forward. Annie Wills. Thank you very much for that intervention. And I did welcome the, the fact that the, the Minister and the Scottish Government were accepting these recommendations, and some had already been actioned. And I will work with, I will speak to my colleagues in Westminster to see where they are with the report and what the recommendations are going to be from that as well. And there is cross-party support across the Chamber. As we've heard, Jackson Carlow, Neil Finlay and Alex Neil have all worked tirelessly in this campaign for years, and I have met with the women themselves. And we just want this to be the right thing for those women. Because other recommendations, such as a proposed redress agency, revisions to the MHRA, and improvements to the transparency of the GMC, 
would need to be considered on a UK-wide basis, and the Scottish Government's particip participation would be welcome. Our amendment intends to ensure that women who require corrective surgery have it performed by a surgeon they trust and do not suffer financial penalty for it. This represents not just a sensible step forward in terms of treatment, but would also send a message to those affected that we are committed to doing right by them. It would allow them to have the confidence in the surgical team taking this forward, confidence that has been shaken by their harrowing experiences over, over the years. There has been some debate around the role of surgeons from overseas, particularly Dr Bronicus, as has been mentioned by other speakers today. And I too would urge the Health Secretary to redouble her efforts to get him here, and if that's not possible, allow the women to go to him, for the sake of the women who feel let down in their interactions with the NHS so far. Our amendment seeks to address a fundamental issue as we will try to move forward, and I know that I've heard that parties across the Chamber will support it. Presiding officer, the Cumberland report and its conclusions are not easy to read, but they shouldn't be. They should, however, focus our minds on the action that must be taken now to ensure that circumstances that led to the disastrous side effects of medications and treatments cannot be the case again. To ensure that the women who had the courage to speak out after suffering life-changing harms receive the best possible care in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Alexandra Stewart. Ms McAlpine, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today, and I particularly welcome the news that Cabinet Secretary has established such a positive dialogue with Baroness Cumberledge, uh, whose report is so welcome. My remarks today are about sodium valpare, a drug which has had devastating effects uh, on some of my constituents. Uh, it was given to pregnant mothers despite extensive evidence that it damaged unborn children. Uh, one little girl uh, I met today actually outside the parliament is only seven years old uh, and yet the drug's dangers have been known about since the 1970s. I followed the campaign on mesh implants ably led by colleagues across this parliament and, and those brave women um, who have been praised today quite rightly. The sodium valproate issue has received less attention, but I hope that after Cumberledge and after today's debate, that will change. I know that my constituents, Charlie and Leslie Bethune, um, who have recently formed the Scottish Do No Harm Valproate Group, are determined to change this. These families deserve nothing less. As someone who remembers the scandal of thalidomide in the 1970s, I find it shameful that a similar scandal can occur as if no lessons had been learned at all. Sodium valproate, as others have explained, is an anti-epilepsy drug, which is also prescribed for bipolar disorder and occasionally migraine. It can cause spina bifida and malformations of the face, skull, limbs, heart, kidney, urinary tract, and sexual organs. A lady I spoke to outside the parliament today lost her baby daughter at the age of six months due to a heart defect and had other children uh, with de developmental disorders. It's, expected, it's estimated that 30 to 40% of affected children uh, have delayed development, learning disability and autism spectrum disorders. The lady I spoke to only discovered the connection to sodium valproate when she met other Scottish campaigners just two years ago. These statistics that I quote on birth defects appear on the 2018 NHS leaflet, in, uh, which informs mothers uh, of childbearing age uh, who are receiving epilepsy treatment. Uh, and I was, I was shocked that it was only in 2018 that this advice was given. Baroness Cumberledge has stated that sodium valproate has been licensed in the UK since 1972. It was known from the very beginning, she says, that it is harmful to unborn children. No one disputes that, she said. Yet even today, hundreds of women who are taking valproate become pregnant uh, without being aware of the risks. Leslie Young, Chief Executive of Epilepsy Scotland, has also said clinical trials in the 1970s clearly documented fetal abnormalities in animals as a concern, yet it continued to be prescribed to women for over 40 years, she says, often with little or no discussion about the associated risks. And of course, families affected often have the double difficulty of coping with children with significant care needs while the mother has her own medical issues. 
Epilepsy Scotland say that despite the Pregnancy Prevent programme, mothers are still not getting the information they need. And like Kenny Gibson, I back the charity's call for a national epilepsy database along the lines he described, although I do welcome the progress that has been made. This is also the view of the Scottish Valprit Group, formed by my constituents, who are, however, very pleased with the announcement of the Patient Safety Commissioner uh, made by the First Minister in the programme for government. Uh, I know they will also take comfort from the Cabinet Secretary's apology on behalf of the government today and her acceptance of Baroness Cumberledge's recommendations. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the Cumberledge recommendation on specialist treatment centres, and this is very important uh, to my constituents. They estimate that there are 1,500 people in Scotland damaged in the womb by this drug, but many go undiagnosed because of a lack of specialist expertise here. Some travel to Manchester to see a neuropsychologist. Um, without proper diagnosis, they can't have appropriate care pathways, and some of those damaged before birth will never live independently. So care is of vital importance, and the group are keen that their needs are considered uh, by the review into adult social care. They also point out that for younger children, uh, it's important that they have a diagnosis to access appropriate educational support. A recommendation three of the report asks for a redress agency, and it's absolutely shocking that a legal case involving Sudan Valpreet victims in England collapsed when the complainants lost legal aid. Uh, these people have absolutely no hope against such a giant pharmaceutical company. Um, the Scottish group recognised that regulation is reserved, but if a redress agency is not established at UK level, they asked if there's anything that we can do in Scotland to bring those responsible to account, because clearly someone is responsible and it's not the mothers who took these drugs. I want to finish by quoting from the British Medical Journal uh, editorial published after the Do No Harm report was published. It said, what the Cumberledge team has flagged is a stubborn flaw that lies at the heart of the practice of medicine. It is often called culture, but this type of embedded attitude seems to go beyond culture, beyond fear of liability, and beyond the profit motive when that exists. It is a patronising and insufficiently curious way of doing business that is often at odds with the realities of helping patients heal and is increasingly out of place in a modern connected world. Our NHS is wonderful in so, Please many, conclude, Ms. so many ways, but once you put a, an institution or certain professionals beyond criticism, you enter into dangerous territory, and it's for us politicians to ensure that all agencies of the state are open to challenge and that uh, and that people who are affected by their mistakes are adequately compensated and supported. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, can I say to members uh, remaining, uh, whether backbenchers or closing speeches, you'll all be given your full time uh, because the presiding office have agreed later to take a motion to extend the debate till 10 past five. So not to worry, though we're running over slightly in this debate, you will be given your full summing up time and open debate time. Alexander Stewart, followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am grateful of the opportunity of participating in today's debate on the recommendations from the report of Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review. We all accept and acknowledge that medical professionals face incredibly difficult situations on a daily basis. The current times we are living through during this COVID-19 pandemic has brought that sharply into focus for us once again. But we all have the right to expect that the benefits of any treatment which we are recommended, will greatly overweigh any associated costs. Clearly, the devastation in the cases of mesh implants, this was not the case, and the immeasurable harm that has been caused to these individual women. And that is why it is vitally important that we acknowledge this today. And I welcome the fact that the report by Baroness Cumberlich indicates first do no harm is a particularly appropriate one for that. It is shocking, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, that this practice was allowed to go on for so long, particularly given that it was continued and we saw in excess of a thousand women still having this treatment after the then Cabinet Secretary of Health, Alex Neil, requested that it would be suspended in 2014. These women were poorly advised and not given the appropriate information to make a genuine and informed choice about whether to have the procedure at all. And in some cases, 
women were not even aware that they were having mesh implanted in their bodies. It is clear that there must have been a comprehensive and systematic failing in this part of the health system. Like many members in this chamber, I have met many of the survivors of mesh implants and I pay tribute to them all for their courage. The complications that they experienced are wide ranging, as well as chronic pain, mobility issues and other physical issues. Many women have suffered difficulties at work, of a personal life and from these procedures. Their stories make for difficult listening to, but each survivor is incredibly brave and resilient for that. As we have heard today, we first acknowledge the pain and that pain and that hurt for these women has had to be endured and that cannot be taken away. But we can and must learn lessons to ensure that we support survivors so that this does not happen again, Deputy Presiding Officer. One of the key recommendations in the report is the appointment of the Patient Safety Commissioner and the announcement in the programme for government last week that this position will be established in Scotland is therefore very, very welcome indeed. It's incredibly important while being accountable to the patient that the new commissioner is completely independent and should not be afraid to speak out and see the truth. While many MSPs and others have spoken out in particular issues, patients deserve a champion specifically tasked to ensuring that their voices are heard going forward. While the commitment made by the government is to put funding aside for the National Mesh Programme, I very much welcome that, but I hope it is and will become much more. I ca it cannot be right that surgeons removing mesh implants from survivors could be the very same who implanted them in the first place. Women who have had mesh implanted understandably have no confidence or trust in these surgeons and as a responsibility for going forward. These women should have the right to have these implants removed by a surgeon of their choice and by one whom they can trust. This is one of the main reasons that we should feel and support this. The state failed for these women and it's reasonable and responsible for the state to do all they can to support them. I'm delighted that members across the chamber will feel that they wish to support the Conservative amendment this evening. But as we have heard time and time again, mesh implants will not just harm women physically but emotionally too. The report very systematically talks about the specifics that happened uh, when it came to treatment and to ensure that individuals uh, suggested removing and, and ensuring that we have some of that consultation and the effects of that are available. I hope that we can all mind and ensure that we support that the mental health efforts of individuals because it's not just the physical problems that they have suffered. Just before I conclude, whilst there are many people who have championed hard for justice for these women affected in treatment, both within this chamber and outside Deputy Presiding Officer. I pay tribute to my colleague Jackson Carlo. He has been a champion for these women and has ensured that the right questions have been asked and that the voices were heard within this parliament. I also pay tribute to Neil Finlay and Alex Neil, who have together ensured that the endeavours of that have taken place. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, we must right the wrongs which have occurred. We must support mesh survivors. We must ensure that they get the treatment that they deserve. And we must ensure that we never let anything like this happen again. I support the amendment in Jackson Carlo's name and encourage others to do likewise. Thank you very much. And I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Polly McNeill. Mr Coffey, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. We have all had constituents affected by these issues and I'd like to share a little of the experience by one local family with their permission, of course. Firstly, I'm delighted that the Scottish Government welcomes the recommendations of the Cumberland Report and is committed to the establishment of the Patient Safety Commissioner in Scotland mentioned by so, so many members today. This will be welcome news to my constituents, the Macero family, whose daughter Claire's life has been adversely affected by sodium valproate, one of the key areas covered in the review. The McKerrow family has long been actively involved in the attempts to get full recognition to the damaging effects this prescribed drug has and continues to have on families. Charlie and Caroline McKerrow 
gave evidence to the Cumberland Review Group when it met in the Juries Inn in Glasgow on the 13th of November 2018. I believe they were one of, the only, one of only two families who did so. They followed this up by writing to the review team and provided a very personal account of their daughter Claire's story. I must thank Mr and Mrs McCarrow and especially Claire for sharing their experience and informing the Cumberland Review so thoroughly and poignantly of the consequences this drug has had on their lives and those of similar families across Scotland and the UK. This is the culmination of years of battling for the McCarrows to be heard. Their motivation throughout these long years has been to stop other families from being harmed and to obtain financial and care support for their daughter Claire and people like her. The amount of time and effort this family has dedicated in trying to redress the lack of knowledge surrounding the effects of sodium valproate and to highlight the need for care and support for those who bear its consequences is quite remarkable. Prior to the Cumberland Review, the McCarrolls have made significant process having dealt directly with the BBC, professors of medicine, GPs and hospital consultants at each and every stage of Claire's life to demonstrate the link between sodium valproate drug, the drug that Caroline took while pregnant and the disabilities Claire, who is now an adult, has suffered to her growth and development, to her ability to lead a normal family life and to meet any needs she may have for the future. Presiding officer, sodium valproate has done this family significant harm and it is my sincere hope that as is recommended by Baroness Cumberledge, the state and manufacturers have a moral responsibility to provide ex gratia payments to those who have experienced avoidable damage from the interventions we have reviewed. I would like to extend thanks to the McCarroll family who have never given up their fight to obtain recognition of the damage sodium valproate did during Caroline's pregnancy. Presiding officer, over the last few years, I've been approached by several constituents who have also experienced transvaginal mesh complications. And I also met some of them, like so many other members in Parliament, in 2017. These women described their experiences as life-altering, telling, har telling harrowing stories of excruciating pain, having to give up their jobs, which leads on to difficulties claiming benefits and relationships with partners breaking down. It has to be said too, President Officer, that many women have had successful mesh procedures, which have been truly transformational for them. And we need to better understand why it works well for some women, but has been a disaster for many others. But I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Government has introduced and opened up applications for the million pounds fund created to help support women who have experienced complications. And my constituents welcome this announcement warmly. I'm also grateful to the First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for their programme, of gov programme for government commitment to establish this patient safety commissioner role and for their apology to those affected as well as their families who have had to watch their loved ones suffer. There's been great disappointment, of course, that Dr Veronikis um, has not been able to accept the offer of Scottish, the Scottish Government to come to Scotland and I very much hope that the recent Scottish Government letter to Dr Veronikis may change, may result in a change in that position. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's request to the National Services Scotland to establish a, hold on a wee minute please, to establish a national designated service for complex mesh removal for those who require specialist surgery to mitigate complications of their surgery. I'm happy to take an intervention if there's time to write. Thank Mr Coffey very much. Just very the, briefly, please. The, the letter I've had from, uh, that I've got Dr Veronica sent to the Cabinet Secretary says, for clarity's sake, I have never received a written offer from the First Minister yourself, the Scottish CMO, or any other government or NHS official. I've taken the project partners that you appointed at their word and have been disappointed. My original offer to come to Scotland to help mesh injured women is the only offer that ever existed. Mr Coffey, and you must conclude at six minutes, please. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I, I, I can't respond to that, Mr Finlay, only to let the Cabinet Secretary say what she said in her opening remarks to you, and perhaps she can address it in the winding up. Finally, in my remarks, presiding officer, great thanks are due to Baroness Cumberledge and the review team for listening to families like the McCarrows and for making the nine recommendations which form the basis of more work to come, and also 
to the Sodium Valprate Advisory Group members who listen to the concerns of patient groups. These families, along with those affected by transvaginal mesh implants and primados, have waited too long to obtain the redress that they so rightly deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Coffey. And I call Polly McNeill to be followed by Rona Mackay. Ms McNeill, please. Presiding officer, this is a harrowing and alarming story, and one which has not yet ended, but at last recognised. And it's quite clear to me that the women involved must have a say in the way forward. And I support Alec Neill's suggestion that the independence of a patient safety commissioner is paramount. And I'd be interested to hear from ministers in coming up what Dr. Vorakia's conditions are, because we didn't hear them. This is a story of pain ignored, of complaints not believed, of avoidable harm, if women had been listened to. One of a culture of an NHS with system failures that don't seem very easy to correct, closed doors, a lack of transparency, women's health destroyed, lives destroyed, and a lack of confidence in a system to fix it. If it weren't for the powerful efforts of Neil Findlay, Jackson Carlaw and Alec Neil, I would not know about these women. Yet it is one of the most disturbing, disturbing health cases I've heard in my career. As Neil Findlay says, women must have control over their own bodies. It's a fundamental basis of women's equality and therefore it presents such a serious setback, setback for women in so many damning ways. The report which saw Baroness Julia Cumberledge and her team travel throughout the UK, including Scotland, where they met and listened to 700 mostly women. And the report highlights the shocking experience of so many women who have suffered as a result of men being placed in their bodies, sometimes without their full knowledge. It also examines the experiences of women who were given the home pregnancy test prima dos associated birth with birth defects and miscarriages that Joan McAlvey has talked about and the anti-epileptic drug sodium valproate, which causes physical malformations, autism and developmental delays in many children when it's taken by mothers during their pregnancy. Unbelievable. Kath Sansom, who founded Sling the Mesh campaign, has welcomed the recommendations, but she says the report is hard-hitting, harrowing, and recognises the total failure in patient safety regulation and oversight in the UK. It also makes very clear that our medical establishment is deeply entrenched in institutional denial and misogyny. And to me, this statement by Kath is hugely telling of the nature of the failure, a system failure to these women, and it's at the very heart of the problem. June Ray's story is also typical. She had vaginal mesh repair to treat prolapse and incontinence in 2009. And she said, I did have some concerns ahead of surgery but I was repeatedly told that there was nothing to worry about. And the complications started four years later. She said, I could feel my body deteriorating, and sometimes the pain was so severe that I wanted to pass out. But when I told GPs and surgeons, they didn't believe me, and they looked at me like I was mad. And this is fundamental to understanding the failures of what happened to these women, that women were not believed. And sadly, research suggests that women's pain is taken much less seriously by doctors than men's is. The gender pain gap has a number of serious, far-reaching implications, including that women in acute pain are left to suffer longer in hospitals and more likely to be misdiagnosed with mental health problems due to misogynist stereotyping, that women are emotional when it comes to their pain. And one of the most concerning things in the report is the culture within the medical profession that often leads to women's concerns being dismissed. Women found themselves up against a defensive, sexist system, a culture of denial, which stopped those women from being heard. And rather than being taken seriously, women routinely had attributed this to their psychological issues. And uh, Baroness Cumberledge notes that in her travels around the country and the volume of emails and correspondence she received from patients, it was almost universal that women spoke in the disbelief, sadness and anger about the manner in which they were treated by clinicians. She said the words defensive, dismissive and arrogant cropped up with alarming frequency and some clinicians reacted ranging from, it's all in your head, oh these are women's issues, 
or it's your time of life or anything and everything that women suffer is perceived as a precursor to pre-symptomatic phase of the menopause. In conclusion, presiding officer, I think the conflicts of interest of some aspects of the medical profession and the financial links between the pharmaceutical industry was highlighted in the report. And it states, all that we have heard leads us to conclude the system is not safe enough for those taking medications in pregnancy or being treated using new devices and techniques. Uh, this issue is not one of a single or a few rogue medical practitioners or differences in regional practice. She said it is system wide. And therefore, there must be an immediate priority set to give these women the health care that they demand and the health care that they trust, whatever that may be. And I do think there's work for the Equalities Minister to look at the way that women were treated, an attitude that is unacceptable in any public service. And I hope that we can work together with ministers, with the women, those affected by it, to make sure that this never, ever happens again. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms McNeill, and I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Doris will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First, do no harm. That's the title of Baroness Cumberledge's review and recently published report into three life-changing medical interventions that have harmed women beyond measure. As we've heard this afternoon, the hormone pregnancy test, Primados, the anti-epileptic drug sodium valproate, and surgical mesh implants, which have been a long-standing source of huge concern and controversy for many sufferers in Scotland and throughout the UK before I was elected in 2016. Presiding officer, we now know that terrible harm was done by these drugs and treatment. The drugs in that invasive, damaging mesh treatment should never have been given to women. Collectively, thousands of lives have been ruined and an entire generation is paying the price of clinical mismanagement. Pa Baroness Cumberland Ba Baroness Julia Cumberledge's review considered a range of matters, including whether any further action is needed relating to the complaints around prima dose, sodium valproate and surgical mess. The process is followed by the NHS and its regulators when patients report a problem and how to make sure communication between the different groups involved is good, which of course until now has been entirely non-existent. The review has also made recommendations regarding the three specific interventions, but also about how the healthcare system can improve its response to concerns raised about other medicines and medical devices in the future. Presiding officer, the fact that these medical outrages affect women is sadly not surprising. I entirely agree with Alison Johnson, Claire Adamson, Polly McNeill and others on this. Women's health has historically been at the back of the priority queue and we know from the cross-party group on women's health in this parliament convened by Monica Lennon and the work done by my colleague Minister uh, Christina McKelvey, that many long-standing issues affecting women's health need to be addressed now. A range of conditions such as endometriosis, perinatal care, thyroid, the effects of the menopause, painful periods and much more have for far too long been seen as women's issues. Thankfully, societal and clinical attitudes are finally changing, but it really shouldn't have taken so much work and suffering of victims to get to where they are now, where we are now. Presiding officer, for two and a half years, Baroness Cumberledge and her team travelled across the UK and met more than 700 women and their families to find out the impact these medical devices had. When what they heard was harrowing, relationships destroyed, lost homes, careers broken and financial ruin. Some even faced their children being taken into care. Baroness Cumberledge said they spoke of the most intimate, intimate details, not only about their lives, but about their bodies. They spoke with such dignity and courage. Above all, I want to thank them. Presiding officer, mesh sufferers in Scotland have been through too much. Their fight for justice and recognition should never have had to happen. On top of their disabling health issues, the mental exhaustion of battling against a system which was for a long time, for far too long in denial, must have been completely overwhelming. During my time as an elected politician, all of McElroy and Elaine Holmes have been at the forefront of that battle. And my admiration for their strength is a constant source of amazement to me. I must also mention the great work done by the Meshketeers, Neil Finlay, Alec Neil, and Jackson Carlow by highlighting their plight in this chamber and beyond. Thanks too should go to campaigning journalist Marion Scott, who's been with them every step of the way, unflinching in our determination to help them achieve justice. Presiding officer, there isn't enough time to go over all the watershed moments in the mesh sufferers' plight, and we, but we've heard many of them uh, today. 
So where, where are we now and are we finally getting there when it comes to some sort of reparation? I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary outline the progress that has been made. The Scottish Government have implemented one of the recommendations in the Cumberland Review by appointing a Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland, announcing the programme for Government last week. And I support Alec Neil's proposal that of, on the independence of that post. This is a very welcome initiative, but sadly, one that the UK Government has yet to ratify. There's also an established £1 million mesh fund open now for sufferers to help with ongoing uh, problems related to their conditions. Scotland's new ma national mesh service is a huge step forward for campaigners and one that's been long fought for. However, I was unaware of the claims being made by Neil Finlay today and, and uh, we'd like to find out more about that. Um, it does sound very concerning and I think patients should come first and they must, the women must be listened to. Nevertheless, I hope the Cumberledge report will act as a watershed and women will be listened to and heard because this is a human rights issue for women and a humanitarian issue, and one that all of us must believe is finally being addressed. And that the courage of all the women affected by drugs they should not have been given, or treatment they should never have been subjected to, will be recognised, and their fight will help generations of women to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, call Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start, as others have done, by thanking Jackson Carlaw, Neil Finlay and Alec Neil for their efforts in championing women who have been afflicted by mesh implants. But most of all, I want to thank women campaigners, the mesh survivors. The matter I'm raising this afternoon, I've written to the Cabinet Secretary regarding um, in my constituent surgery in 2014. I will not name them. However, the issues they've raised, I think we've heard right across the chamber here this afternoon. Uh, her consultant at that time insisted my constituent was not receiving mesh, but rather tape. Indeed, her consultant, just last year in fact, remained adamant that actually at that time uh, the Scottish Government had not sought to spend mesh implants. Both these assertions were simply not true. At a follow-up meeting with another clinical clinician ahead of my constituent surgery, they raised concerns over the procedure. That is, the other clinician raised concerns over the procedure and suggested that my constituent thinks carefully ahead of agreeing that procedure. However, the final meeting was with the consultant surgeon once more, who again told my constituent the constituent procedure was perfectly safe, involved the use of tape as opposed to mesh, and the concerns were being exaggerated. My constituent feels clearly misled and misinformed by her consultant. It is hardly surprising then that women who feel so badly let down will struggle to have confidence in any national pelvic mesh removal service. I therefore support Jackson Carlaw's amendment, which states that this must include the early prospect of full transvaginal vaginal mesh removal surgery when undertaken by surgeons who enjoy the full confidence of the women affected, fully funded by the NHS. That brings me on to some of the points raised by Neil Finlay. My constituent has asked, as other mesh campaigning women have also a number of questions, and Mr Finlay mentioned some of those this afternoon as well. I was asked to ask, can you find out who will be running this new mesh centre in the names of the surgeons doing removal of full TVTO. My constituent concerned her consultant from 2014 is part of that team. I was asked what additional training, if any, have they received in mesh removal and who trained them in the full removal process? How many TVTO removals have been done in the past five years and of those, how many were full removals? How many patients found it successful and how many we consider it to have failed? Now, Mr Finlay calls for the halt of the development of the special service until these questions have been answered. That might be actually be a moot point because I suggest that many of the women may not engage with the new special service unless these questions are answered anyway. I would therefore ask the level of detail that my constituent and others can expect as the Scottish Government addresses the questions raised. My constituent following surgery had substantial and almost immediate health issues. She struggled to be taken seriously, listened to, and not simply dismissed. That's a common theme, I think, across the chamber um, this afternoon. Indeed, my constituent felt that lies and the misinformation continued throughout. My constituent continues to be in severe pain and has mobility issues. They also believe they continue to get conflicting information. On the one hand, told that they've had tape, and not mesh, 
on the other hand, told that tape can be removed, only to discover that this would be a clip and a partial removal. These themes are fairly consistent in all the stories that are in the public domain. I would welcome, actually I'd welcome more information of the case record review, which will be carried out for mesh injured women that we've heard about this afternoon. That will be really important in building up trust, I feel. I actually do commend the speedy action of Jean Freeman on responding to powerful Cumberland's report, accepting the recommendation for a patient safety commissioner, the £1 million for mesh survivors, and the steps taken to develop a national mesh removal service, and for the ongoing commitment to continue to engage with Baroness Cumberledge. These are all vitally important. I suggest, though, that that's probably a starting point. However, I'd like to finish by urging the NHS and the Scottish Government to allow mesh survivors to make an informed choice over treatment where possible. I don't know how we do that, be that Dr Veronica is performing mesh removal and supporting aftercare, and that's the important thing, and supporting aftercare in Scotland or somewhere else, or through the building up of confidence in the National Complex Mesh Removal Service. It's what works for the women who are victims. That is the underlying and most powerful aspect that we're debating today. And actually in that, we've got complete cross-party agreement by government, by opposition. What we're doing is mapping out together how best to get there. And I thank you, President Officer, for giving the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate. Thank you, Mr Doris. And our closing speeches, now I call Alison Johnson, close for the Green Party. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Baroness Cumberledge concluded that the system is not safe enough. She pointed to systemic failings and she noted that patients have suffered at the hands of clinicians. Her recommendation number one was that the government should offer, should issue immediately a fulsome apology on behalf of the healthcare system to the families affected, as I very much welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary did so this afternoon in her opening remarks. We've been debating this issue in this Parliament for a long time, and we're not finished yet, and it's absolutely essential that we prioritise time in this chamber until we are satisfied that everything that can be done has been done for the mesh survivors and all impacted. I share others' frustrations. It just seems, you know, quite frankly tragic that we still have no agreement in relation to Dr. Veronica's coming to Scotland so that those who need his help most can benefit from that. And Alex Cole Hamilton was right to highlight the dignity of the mesh survivors in the face of so much pain and suffering and frustration. Um, I think there have been so many excellent contributions in this debate that I will struggle to, to refer to them all. I agree wholeheartedly with Alex Neil that the, um, the Patient Safety Commissioner should be a wholly independent appoint, um, appointment with the power that will make a difference, as Alexander Stewart said, a champion for patients. Um, Brian Whittle pointed out that this is not the first time we debated MESH um, and it absolutely will not be the last. Now, I noted when we were debating this issue in 2017 in response, what well, was in response to a statement, um, that 98% of the women in the report said that their consent to MESH surgery was not informed and 70% said their surgeon wasn't open to the idea that MESH was the cause of their symptoms. And I think there is much to debate in that idea of informed consent. What does it mean? It means that permission is granted by the patient in full knowledge of the possible consequences. And I think many of us across the chamber are aware that the women did not understand what the potential consequences were. And in going forward, I'd be really grateful if the cabinet secretary could elaborate on what information women might expect to have in future in relation to any procedure that they may be going to have. It's not always enough to be offered a, a booklet. It really is important that people have the chance to speak to others who've suffered similarly. Um, Bob Doris was right to highlight the questions that remain outstanding. And you know, he noted that women are still receiving conflicting information about the device that they have implanted in their own bodies. And I think um, Alexander Stewart made that point too, that there were, the, the review highlights instances where women didn't know that they'd had mesh implanted or where the mesh was referred to by another name, such as tape. 
or even where women had been told that they'd undergone full mesh removal only to find out later that that wasn't the case. And, you know, likewise, we've heard today of women who were never told of the effect Valproate could have on their unborn children. I'm sure we'd all agree that this is simply unacceptable. And it's not the, f it, you know, despite the fact that it's not their fault, many of the women heartbreakingly spoke to the review of their guilt about the terrible toll their treatment has taken on their relationships and family life. So more must be done to improve health literacy and to ensure that the benefits and risks of medical interventions are explained clearly and in a way that patients can understand. The review states that every patient should be able to stand back, look at their patient journey and say, I recognise my handwriting all over those choices. And I wonder how many patients in Scotland can do that today in the, the cases we've discussed this afternoon. Um, the review notes that there remains an overriding culture in parts of our NHS of doctor knows best. And many people accessing health services won't feel confident enough to challenge the recommendations of their clinicians. And some may not even know if they can. So I would be interested to hear what action the Scottish Government will take to emphasise, to get out the message that patient care should be the result of a conversation, one in which they participate fully. Um, I will be voting for Jackson Carlaw's amendment. Actually, I'll be voting for all amendments this afternoon. Um, Jackson Carlaw's uh, um, amendment is absolutely correct. It's imperative that the mesh survivors have access to full mesh removal sur surgery and that that's provided at no cost to them. That's the very least they deserve. Um, I will also be supporting Neil Finlay's amendment and a temporary suspension of the development of the removal service because it's absolutely essential that those accessing that service have complete trust and faith in those who will be undertaking their surgery. I do appreciate the comments the Cabinet Secretary made in this regard about two processes continuing at the same time, but there can be no more errors. These women have put up with enough. They have to have whole-hearted confidence in the service. Um, I think Joan McAlpine rightly highlighted the challenges for those seeking redress, particularly when you're coming up against large bureaucratic organisations and companies. And we have to make sure that the strength is there for the individual to challenge those decisions and impacts on lives that, you know, quite frankly, have been devastating. I think um, I'm closing now, presiding officer, but Rona Mackay and Pauline McNeill rightly highlighted system-wide failures impacting hugely on women. Um, we have some way to go, and I think, um, yeah, I look forward to continuing to debate this important issue with colleagues across the chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Neil Finlay, close for Labour. Seven minutes, please, uh, Mr Thanks, President Officer. It may have been eight years, but it's been an excellent debate, and I, I would commend uh, Claire Adamson and Dave Stewart, uh, 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 Alison Johnson, Alec Cole Hamilton, Polly McNeill, uh, and of course Jackson Carlow and Alec Neal in their speeches but I have to say I thought the best speech of the day was Bob Doris's speech it was an absolutely outstanding contribution to today's debate um, I have to say primados and uh, sodium uh, valproate caused horrific damage to children uh, and like mesh the medical establishment led by the big pharmaceutical companies closed ranks and denied there was a problem we saw denial and cover-up and regulatory failure governance failure Institutional greed, professional arrogance, and all the time, profit placed before people. I was thinking back, uh, presiding officer, to 2012, when I first got involved in this campaign. And I'm going to tell you something that the uh, presiding officer might balk at, but it's a quote. And we called a press conference to try and get the Scottish media interested in this issue. And one journalist turned up. And I asked... A very senior journalist from the Parliamentary Press Pack, why they didn't turn up. And I quote, he said, we don't write about women's fannies. Quote, that's what he said, that we couldn't discuss medical problems about a woman's anatomy or a reproductive system in 2012 in Scotland in this parliament. Forget the fact that the same newspaper only a few years back was printing semi-naked photographs of women at the same time but that's how far we've traveled since 2012 and I have to say thank you to the campaign and journalist Marion Scott who is an outstanding tour de force and without her help we would be nowhere near where we are today and every one of those women who've campaigned 
and push this at every opportunity. Baroness Cumberledge's review is, a, I think, a watershed. She talked about it not being single or a few rogue medical practitioners, a system-wide problem, problem. She talked about the failure to listen to concerns and when belatedly uh, it is deci uh, they've decided to act, it has often been glacially. Eight years to bring a debate to this chamber simply confirms the point that she makes about glacial progress. The review is a damning indictment, indictment of the failings in the system across all three areas. There were similar experiences for victims. Lack of information to make informed choices. Lack of awareness of who to complain to and how to report adverse incidents. The struggle to be heard, not being believed. Dismissive and unhelpful attitudes from clinicians. A sense of abandonment. Life-changing consequences for the patient and friend of the family and we've heard about from various speakers, family breakdown, loss of jobs, financial support, and sometimes housing, loss of identity and a feeling of self-worth, persistent feeling of guilt, and children eh, becoming their mothers and siblings' carers. Clinicians untutored in the skills required to carry out proper diagnosis and treatment. Clinicians not knowing how to learn from patients, inaccurate and altered patient records, and a lack of interest in monitoring advert adverse outcomes. President officer, I'm a great champion of the NHS. It's the greatest social policy ever implemented. But when things go badly wrong, it must be better than it is in accepting it and responding to mistakes. The nine recommendations come with a number of changes uh, attached to them. And the government has already issued a fulsome apology uh, uh, on behalf of the healthcare system to the families affected by Primidor, Sodium Valpre and Pelvic Mesh. But we've heard nothing from NHS boards. We've heard no apology from clinicians or the regulator or the manufacturers. Where is their apology for their role in this? The government has agreed to a patient safety commissioner and that is very welcome. That, but that person must carry the confidence of survivors of Mesh, Primidor and Sodium Valpre. And I would suggest that they are heavily involved in the recruitment of this person. I think Alec Neal's uh, suggestion is very good. They cannot be a hand-picked pick, place, woman or man. And I think Alec's suggestions are a sensible way forward. I hope that patients will be at the, the centre of the review group that's to be established to oversee the implementation uh, of all of this. And it's done properly. Unlike when we had the independent review in Scotland, where there was all sorts of shenanigans went on to exclude patients from the decision-making that went on within that body. But my greatest concern is over the new mesh service. I desperately, desperately want it to work. I hope it's a roaring success. But I don't want it to work as much as the Scottish mesh survivors want it to work. They could have the opportunity to be free of pain and suffering and the constant psychological trauma of having this poison in their body. They are desperate for it to work. But I fear we're about to repeat the very mistakes that Baroness Cumberledge has just identified. None of the Scottish mesh survivors have been involved in the design of the service. It's been a hand-picked few done through the Alliance. They don't, the Scottish mesh survivors group don't even know who they are. I've just had text from them telling me that. The review identified the struggle to be heard, clinicians untutored uh, in the skills required, dismissive and unhelpful attitudes, failures of governance, professional arrogance, failed regulation, defensiveness. We have the opportunity to help women, but by ignoring the concerns that they've raised about the new service, we will repeat the mistakes of the past. Let's just stop non-urgent procedures now. Pause the development of the service, uh, not scrap it, no one's saying that, and take on board their concerns and answer all the questions that Bob Doris laid out. These are the very legitimate questions, the very legitimate questions that I've written to the government and asked as well. Take on board these concerns. T take the input from the women. They are knowledgeable, they are talented, they're intelligent, and they will help design a service that we and they can all
be proud of. I plead with members, don't allow us to collectively repeat the mistakes that Baroness Cumberledge has just identified. Let us do no harm. Thank you very much. And, and uh, before I call Jackson Carlaw, I'm minded to take a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 to extend decision time till 5.10. Uh, 5 um, could you move that, Mr. Dean? Thank you very much. Does anyone object? You agreed to it being extended? That's their, I'm taking silence as agreement. Yes, you've agreed. Uh, I now call Jackson Carlaw. Mr. Carlaw, nine minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I say this is the first closing speech uh, I've given for several years in this parliament. I've been detained in other ways, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to contribute to such an outstanding and informed debate as the one we've had this afternoon. And although most of the content that I'll want to address relates to the whole mesh uh, scandal and the way it has unfolded. Can I thank in particular uh, Kenny Gibson? Uh, I must apologize to Mr. Gibson. His lectern was up earlier on and I wasn't sure who it was. And I did ask Brian Whittle if it was Christine Graham who was sitting there, which <laughs> maybe the first time that, uh, that you've been, that, that accident has been made. But I'd like to thank Kenny Gibson, Joan McAlpine and Willie Coffey for bringing in uh, the issues relating to Valproate and Primados as well, an issue which Theresa May is also uh, fo focused on at Westminster. Uh, because all of these health scandals summed up in the work of Baroness Cumberledge um, deserve attention and I'm so pleased that the government is uh, taking forward the recommendations that have been made. Um, it was on November the 25th last year that the First Minister did meet with uh, many of the Mesh women. Uh, it's true it was during a general election. It's a little uncharitable to suggest there was a connection. It was in response to a request I made at First Minister's Questions, and the original date was postponed due to a bereavement in the First Minister's family, as I recall. Um, but she did meet them, and she did meet a second group of women in Edinburgh, and I think did hear firsthand the very powerful testimonies that members of this chamber had heard meeting these women over a great many years. Five years before that, as we've heard, Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy launched their petition in the Parliament. And it was in 2007, several years before that, that MESH procedures first began in the NHS. You could say, well, Nicola Sturgeon was a Health Secretary, but that is a coincidence rather than a consequence. And so for three Parliaments, we have gone from the implementation of MESH to hearing what the consequences of MESH implementation had been to going through a series of investigations and reports as to what we would do about it, and still just now months away from a fourth parliament, when, please, we must ensure that we finally resolve and draw a line under the suffering of the women who have been the subject of mesh implants. And let me start with the recommendation number six uh, in relation to the MHRA, because I think Angus MacDonald might be the only surviving member of the petitions committee at that time, I forget, uh, I, I apologize if there are others, who heard the appalling testimony of the MHRA, who came along and in front of a room full of mesh suffering women, told them that the um, approvals process had been a two week desktop study by three students at a cost of 20,000 pounds, and that as far as he was concerned, there were maybe a handful of women who'd been adversely affected, never mind the rows sitting behind him at the time. And if any service is unfit uh, for purpose, it is the MHRA. And I, it is, it, yes, it's a reserve function at Westminster. That's not an issue of contention. If ever a motion came before this parliament, all parties would be united in saying that now must be completely changed and addressed. And it was after that, not then, but after that, we found out that some of the people in the MHRA had direct in links to the industries who were producing the mesh product, which had gone undeclared and from which they were profiting. That is completely unacceptable and why that whole MHRA requires to be the subject of major change and review. And I support the Cabinet Secretary and we will support the Cabinet Secretary in arguing that that take place. Um, so many people have talked about the way in which the women's voices have been dismissed about um, the way that they were treated. And you know, it goes on today. Uh, for those of us who sit on the uh, cross-party group in chronic pain, if you're a man, did you play football, son, when you were younger? Uh, did you have an accident at work? Were you in the armed forces? Um, have you been a fighter in your youth or something? If you're a woman, are you feeling a bit under the weather with all that you're having to do? And can we give you some antidepressants and see if that helps? 
That is a ridiculous inequality in the way women are treated within the health service today. And let me say, if people stand up and tell you that they are suffering unbelievable chronic pain and are unable to carry on with their normal lives, it's because they probably are. And that that symptom should be taken seriously and addressed. And again, in the petitions committee, I and others sat in a room where we saw men in grey suits argue to the very women sitting at the back of the room. It was all on their head. They really weren't suffering at all. And if only that, you know, if they could speak to somebody about it, they would probably go over it all and all would be well. And that was not kind of people who uh, you might have met in the street. These were the clinicians who had been implementing the mesh and who were in complete denial that there was any adverse consequence as a result. And I remember when Elaine Holmes walked through the door of my constituency office, trembling at the thought she was going to have to discuss with a man something that was unbelievably intimate. And it is because of her courage that I am happy to have worked across party for the last three parliaments on this issue because it has become one of those issues about which I've become more passionate than anything else and I'm determined to see justice uh, achieved. We should, also, we should also remember that for much of the progress of this, it was about stopping it happening again. That was the objective of the women concerned. They didn't really think mesh removal was an option. They didn't think it was an option because you've only got to think about mesh and the way in which tissue grows around it and the extraordinary difficulty that there would be, if not excruciating pain, to actually try and remove it. It wasn't just because, it was because that we've moved from that to a point where mesh removal is now an option. And that's what underpins uh, my amendment. Because I don't, as like Alec Neal, necessarily want to get into the whys and wherefores of what Dr. Veronicus may or may not do or have said in coming here. I want the women to know and it's a finite number, we may still have to quantify how many, but if we're not implementing any further mesh, it's a, it's, a, it's a quantifiable number. I want those women to know that if it comes to the bit, they can go to the United States, they can go to Dr. Veronicus, and they can have that mesh removed, fully funded by the NHS. And that is what two of my constituents have done. Elaine Holmes herself, at a cost of some £20,000, and Lorna Farrell, who you can watch on YouTube. You can watch on YouTube as she, having had the mesh removed, went to Philadelphia to the bottom of the steps that Rocky Balboa ran up and with her crutches out of a wheelchair for the first time in years, I think it was more than she actually realized she was taking on, if I'm being honest, struggles up to the top of those steps and turns in triumph, having got some control back over her life. And I want that to be something, whether it's there or whether it's through the other processes that the First Minister, uh, the, First Minister the Health Secretary, are seeking to achieve. I want that to be an option now, open to all those women who've given so much of their own lives to fight for this cause, to actually have hope for the future future themselves. <laughs> Presiding officer, um, some people have been quite kind about Neil Finlay, Alec, uh, Neil and I this afternoon. I've got to say we did meet earlier today. We actually solved all the problems of the world. So if the government falls, we stand ready to serve and we are, we are flattered by your confidence. But there were a lot of other people uh, as well. We've heard mention of Marion Scott, who has been an absolutely tireless emotional support to the women and investigative journalists. Actually to Mandy Rhodes and the Holyrood magazine team, who have actually been quite uh, quite hard working in this as well, to Will Auger, who is a clinician who has enjoyed the confidence of the women throughout, and of course to uh, Elaine, to Olive, and to the other tireless women who have campaigned on this issue over these th three parliaments. Two of those meshketeers have indicated that they won't be coming back. I can only say that the electorate are kind enough to return me. I will work with Rona Mackay, with others who are going to be coming back, who themselves have become real champions of this issue over the last few years, to ensure that in the fourth parliament, when mesh is an issue, that the resolutions that we make today, the recommendations that we implement, actually finally draw a line under the, under the mesh scandal, and that we give these women, all of these women, the justice they deserve. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlo. I call on Jean Freeman to close the government. Cabinet Secretary till 10 past, please. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm
I'm, I've got my notes are wrong, it's not my fault. Somebody is there, I'm looking around. And I will <laughs> call Claire Hockey to close the government uh, minister till 10 past. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And I'd like to thank all of the members who have contributed to this afternoon's debate. I would also like to extend my thanks to Baroness Cumberledge and her review team, as well as those who contributed to this report's findings. The Cabinet Secretary and I were grateful to meet with the Baroness and her team yesterday, and she spoke of the courage, determination and strength shown by those who came forward to tell their story. And both the Cabinet Secretary and I absolutely echoed the Baroness's thoughts. I would take this opportunity to reiterate the Cabinet Secretary's apology to all of those who have been affected by Primados, sodium valparate and mesh. Your tireless campaigning to bring these feelings to public attention while also coping with pain and such upset has been and remains courageous beyond description. We know that for too long women's concerns have not been heard or indeed when they have been heard, they have not always been taken seriously. And, presiding officer, this is not acceptable. Voices must be heard, and we are determined to do all that we can to ensure that we continue our actions to put that right and to ensure that women receive the care and the treatment that they need. And similarly, this also applies to the women, children, and families of those impacted by sodium valparate and primados. The patient must be at the centre of every decision taken about their care. Baroness Cumberledge was clear when we spoke to her yesterday that she is determined to see her recommendations taken forward and for her report to inspire and be a force for change across the UK's healthcare systems. Both the Cabinet Secretary and I are fully behind Baroness Cumberledge and are similarly determined that Scotland leads the way. With that in mind, it's important to remember that this is the latest in a series of reports, including our own independent review of MESH in 2017. And I hope it's clear to this Parliament and first and foremost, those affected, that we are listening and we will continue to do so. Baroness Cumberledge's report gives clear justification for many of the decisive actions we have taken in recent months and years. We brought a halt to the use of sorry, transvaginal mesh in Scotland, and we have no plans to lift this halt. We have established a £1 million fund to help women with the cost of emotional and practical support that they need as a result of mesh complications. And we have progressed plans for the mesh specialist service. Central to this service will be informed consent and shared decision making, fully aligning it with the principles of realistic medicine. And we have established a review of case records for women who raised concern about the extent of their mesh removal. And this will begin soon, and further information on this will be given by the government as soon as possible. Yes, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. The Minister mentioned shared decision making. Um, we know from women who have been in contact with the service that some have been excluded from the multidisciplinary team meetings to discuss their health care. That is some of the concerns that are being raised. That should not be happening. Minister. And, and that's what the independent case review will look at, amongst other issues. Um, we know members' concerns about women who, because they lack trust in services, want to seek treatment elsewhere. And, presiding officer, it's vital that patients have the confidence that every time they access any part of the healthcare system, that they receive the best available treatment without fear of harm. For that reason, we're establishing a patient safety commissioner role, which Baroness Cumberledge passionately advocated yesterday and it is now a programme for government commitment. And as you've heard today, what the role looks like, where it will sit and how it will function, it must take into account the Scottish landscape and of course will require input from patients and the wider public. And I think it was Alec Neil who raised that particular issue about the Patient Safety Commissioner. And the Scottish Government is beginning consultation on that role with patients at the heart of that and the first people that we are consulting. Um, I know it wasn't only yourself who raised that, but it is a really important 
Um, our commitment to patient safety has been and remains a key to delivering healthcare in Scotland. And this role will work alongside our world leading patient safety programme. As the Cabinet Secretary touched on in her opening remarks, it has to be remembered that some of Baroness Cumberland's recommendations are out with the Scottish Government's gift to act on. And I really welcome the commitment from the Scottish Conservatives to work on some of those commitments with us and to encourage the UK Government to act on them. And that said, the Scottish Government will meet with both the General Medical Council and the MHRA over the next few months, and we will seek further reassurances on areas that are not within our devolved powers. We will also do all we can to ensure that Scotland's views are taken forward as an equal partner and will offer support to the UK organisations whenever we can. Scotland has long since called for reform of the MHRA to be more patient focused and outward facing. And this is no secret and we are encouraged by the steps that the agency has taken towards reform thus far. The Cabinet Secretary wrote to the MHRA in support of its efforts and we will continue to press to ensure that change remains a priority. One of the key recommendations was around better data. I think this was referred to by uh, Brian Whittle and his contribution. And this is an area where we can work closely with the MHRA and others across the UK. And this was highlighted as important for patient safety and by clinicians in relation to sodium valparate. And the MHRA and NHS Digital are working on a sodium valparate specific registry. I think this was also an area that uh, Kenneth Gibson um, supported uh, in his calls by uh, Joan McAlpine, uh, raising the issue of a national registry in relation to sodium valparate. And I can confirm to Parliament that we will give early and active consideration to establishing a national sodium valparate registry. Um, in addition, uh, we will consider what else may be needed in Scotland by those affected by sodium valparate and by primidos. Um, in it's important that the Parliament comes together to support the recommendations and themes in Baroness Cumberbatch's review. And I think we've heard that today and to ensure that these are embodied in our health service. As the First Minister has previously stated in Parliament and as has been set out in this debate today, we would urge those who have a genuine concern in these issues to work with us. We must work to rebuild women's trust in services and us working together would be a helpful step in achieving this. We've seen what cross-party support can do in the debate today. In the spirit of working together and having been struck yesterday by Baroness Cumberledge's passion and determination to ensure that our recommendations are implemented and we will continue to seek her views as the Cabinet Secretary outlined as we progress this work across Scotland. I think there were some very um, passionate and, and very interesting contributions across the chamber today. I've acknowledged a few of those. Um, I think it's, it's really important that um, we ensure that Scotland does lead the way, as Donald Cameron said, and actually, as the Baroness said yesterday in our meeting with myself and the Cabinet Secretary, that we are at the forefront of implementing her reviews. I think Alec Cole Hamilton raised issues about surgery being undertaken by surgeons who enjoy the full confidence of the women affected. Um, by um, Mesh and we are supporting that amendment um, by Jackson Carlow and I hope that gives a bit of reassurance to Mr Cole Hamilton in that regard. We heard um, some very considered contributions from David Stewart, from Claire Adamson, from Willie Coffey and Alison Johnson um, and some um, recounts of very um, difficult constituent cases brought to the chamber and represented very ably by the MSPs involved. Um, President Officer, once again, I cannot stress enough the importance, as Baroness Cumberledge did yesterday, of rebuilding the trust of women in our services. Um, we know there is more work to do um, to ensure that this happens, and we are acting now. And I urge the members who have raised the concerns across the chambers to work with us to do so. Thank you very much. And that uh, concludes the debate on the Baroness Cumberledge report. It's time to move on to the next item of business. We'll be a short pause before we do so.
Thank you, colleagues. The next item of business is consideration of motion 22484 on a financial resolution for the Period Products Pre Provision Scotland Bill. Could I call on Ben McPherson to move this motion? Formally moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 22649 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out revisions to Thursday's business. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion. The question is therefore that motion 22649 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Um, I, I'm minded to take a motion without notice to bring forward decision time to now. Minister, would you move such a motion? Thank you very much. Does any member object if I move decision time forward to now? Point of order, Mr Finlay. It, does that mean the bell will go now or is the bell already gone? The, the, both bells have already rung and I'm conscious that if we have a division we will suspend so there will actually be a break. So uh, I'm no, the, the reason being that I th sorry, President Officer, that yeah. I think people were advised it would be ten past that the vote would. Take place. That's right. The original decision time was delayed to ten past. Um, I'm we're either in a situation where the votes will be agreed unanimously, in which case there won't be a division and no one will miss out, um, or there'll be a division, in which case there'll be a technical break, in which case there'll be plenty of time for members who have not yet made it to the chamber, uh, or online, will be able to join us online. Because I'm only moving forward in five minutes. So are we, does it make any member object? In fact, I'll, if no member, uh, Mr. Finlay has made a point of order, I think I will just wait till 10 past five, if you don't mind. We're going to wait till 10 past five to the decision time. Thank you, colleagues. We're going to reach decision time, turn to decision time now, and there are several questions to be put. The first question is that amendment 22635.1 in the name of Jackson Carlaw, which seeks to amend motion 2283, sorry, 22635 in the name of Jean Freeman on the Baroness Cumberledge report be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 22635.3 in the name of Neil Findlay, which seeks to amend motion in the name of Jean Freeman on the Cumberland report, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Now we're not agreed. So we're going to go to uh, a division on this uh, amendment. 
Before we do, we're going to have a technical break, and that's to make sure that all our colleagues online are logged on to the remote voting system. So I'm going to suspend Parliament uh, for a few moments while we make sure that everybody is online, both in the Chamber and online. The Parliament is suspended. And I would say to colleagues that are online, don't worry if you can't hear anything for a minute when broadcasting is suspended, but we will be back within a minute. Don't panic if you hear nothing for the first minute. Parliament is suspended.
Thank you, colleagues. We are uh, now resuming business. Now, the question we divided on is the amendment 22635.3 in the name of Neil Findlay, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jean Freeman on the Bar Baroness Cumberland's report. And members may cast their votes now. This will be a one-minute division on Neil Findlay's amendment to Jean Freeman's motion. Okay, if, you raise your, if any members have difficulty, just raise your hand. Someone will come and uh, hopefully address the problem. Members are online. Again, raise your issue online if you're not able to vote. Colleagues, uh, the vote has closed, but because we've had some uh, technical difficulties with this vote, I'm just going to ask any member who thinks that they were not able to vote to uh, make a point of order now so I can uh, formally recognise that for the record. Stuart McMillan, first of all. Thank you, Training Officer. It's, uh, I did have some difficulties. I would have voted no in that particular vote. That's noted. Thank you very much, Mr McMillan. And I believe... And I believe I'm going to just ask Margaret Mitchell, who is online, uh, again, just to record um, a, a point of order for the record. Where did you think you were able to vote, uh, Ms. Mitchell? N not able to vote. Would have voted yes. Thank you very much. Um, I note both those comments and I'm going to uh, direct our clerks to, to change the vote to make sure both those votes are added to this record now before we announce the result of the vote. Thank you very much, colleagues. The result of the vote on amendment 22635.3 in the name of Neil Findlay is yes, 57, no, 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Yes, point of order from John Scott first. Mr Scott. Um, according to my WhatsApp, apparently Alison Harris was unable to vote. Yes, we just recognised that this second, uh, and we're just addressing that issue. Uh, Mr Finlay? Irrespective of this vote, can we put that to the side? The confidence in this system is ebbing away every single day we come here. And when people have raised very legitimate points of order before on this issue, there has been an insistence that the system is working. The system is self-evidently not working to the satisfaction 
of all members. I, I, I think, getting the feeling from what we are today, I, I, I would think that's a general feeling. We have a major problem with this system, and we cannot continue in the farcical way that we are just now. Thanks for the point of order, Mr. Findlay. Th point of order, Mr. Russell. I haven't even addressed the first one. Mr. Russell. Um, presiding officer, it really pains me to say this, but I agree entirely with Neil Finlay. Um, <laughs> I have, to make, I, have to, I have to make the point that I voted two weeks ago in a remote division on a bill and I was terrified in each division that the vote was not being counted or not being counted properly. Today we have seen a, a vote which at the very least must be one in which this chamber will have no confidence. A vote by a single vote and we do not know whether individuals had voted or not. Could I suggest, presiding officer, maybe controversially, that you suspend this session and that we return to voting tomorrow when we have assurances from you personally that this voting system is working and can be reliable. And if we cannot have those assurances, then we should not be using it. Thank you very much, Mr Russell. Can I suggest that we are debating exactly that option at the moment? Uh, can I suggest that, uh, contrary to Mr Finlay's point of order, um, the system is working. However, however, I recognise that it has major issues at the moment, which is, I agree with Mr Finlay, is undermining confidence. If you don't mind, I'm going to suspend business just now to we work out what happened in that vote and whether or not people miss votes. Just, just let me say this for the record. People miss votes for lots of reasons all the time and under the old system. People in the chamber press the wrong button, they put the card in, they miss votes for lots of reasons, and it happens quite a lot. Now, members might not be aware of that. I can assure you from the chair, I'm highly aware of it. This new system, we're having difficulties. A lot of the difficulties, Mr. Russell, are not with the system. They're with us, our familiarity. Now, I'm not going to defend the system at this stage to you individually. What I'm going to do is make sure that our system is working and that you, Mr. Russell, can have confidence in it. So I'm going to suspend for a few moments while we establish what happened in that particular vote. And I'll get back to you in a few minutes. Thank you, colleagues. We're back um, from suspension now. We resume business. Uh, just let members know, there's clearly, uh, we need to have a, a thorough debrief of what happened in that particular vote um, to make sure that everybody here has confidence that the vote has been carried out, including myself, that it's been carried out uh, effectively and robustly. So we're going to uh, do that vote tomorrow. However, what I'm going to suggest is that 
Um, there is a another question on the period products bill. I'm going to take that vote. If there is a division, we'll also hold that division tomorrow. However, if it's agreed now, uh, that will be able to go through this evening. Point of order, Mr. Finlay. Yes. From the chair, can you express the words that that vote is now annulled, that is invalid, and we will retake the full vote? Because I would like you to say that so that we know exactly that. Th uh, no, I'm not deciding to not run that vote again. That decision will be taken tomorrow. You announced that you declared numbers. You That's right. And I, will, and I will inform the Chamber tomorrow, once we've had a thorough debrief, whether or not that result was a valid result or well, not. No, no, I'm sorry, Mr Finlay. No, this happens... Sir. I'm sorry, Mr Finlay. This happens, and there are procedures laid down in standing orders to deal with situations such as this. The reason that I am um, suspending the vote now and we're going back to tomorrow is to allow me and others to have a look at exactly what happened and I'll be able to give you a firm decision on that tomorrow. And I'm not going to give you a decision now, Mr Finlay. Point of order, Mr Finlay. Is it in order for me to move a position that that vote is annulled and I move that as a formal position and that any vote that is to be taken is taken tomorrow? No, Mr Finlay, it's not an order. I have already given my decision that we are going to come back to this matter tomorrow, at which point I will be able to, and I'll discuss this with the business managers, and I'll make sure that we, the Chamber is fully informed of how we uh, resume our approach to this vote. Uh, but I, I'm afraid we should do this in the light of knowing exactly what happened in that vote. Now, I'm sorry, but we need to know exactly what happened in that vote before we do that, and that's the reason that we are moving everything to tomorrow. However, with the Chair... Oh. Mr Findlay, one more point, please. Yeah, I, I just want to be absolutely clear. Is it, is it within the standing orders of the Parliament that a member is not allowed to move such a motion at this point? I, I, well, I am not accepting such a motion at that point, which is more to the point, Mr Findlay. I'm sorry, Mr Findlay, I'm in the chair at the moment. I've already given you a decision. You're, you can move... Well, we can say what you can, may or may not do tomorrow. At the moment, I am not saying that this... Uh, motion is uh, defeated or annulled or cancelled. I'm going to suspend business on that vote and we'll come back to it tomorrow and I will be able to inform Mr Finlay. The fact that Mr Finlay does not like the outcome of the vote is not the same as not having confidence in the outcome. And I'm sorry, but I need to know what happened in the vote, at which point we'll be able to make a proper decision. At that point, we will make a decision. Now, we've got a final question. Mr. Russell, point of order. Along this, but I think, whilst I accept that you do not have to take clearly a motion from Mr. Finlay, I hope the chamber, you will reassure the chamber of two things. One is that you will consult fully with the business managers on looking at this vote and making sure that they have full access to all the information on it. And secondly, that you will look at the wider question of how this chamber can have confidence restored in the new voting system, given the experience we have had, not just today, but over the last few weeks. Yes. I think, Mr. Fit, Mr Russell, I addressed both those points, which is why we're going to return to the subject tomorrow. Not only will I share it, not only will I share this information with all the business managers, I will make sure all members, all members are fully aware of what happened in that particular vote and of any decision whether to rerun or otherwise. Mr. Mr. Carlo. Jackson Carlo, point of order. Uh, Presiding officer, can I just point out that this confusion has come at the end of a very important debate that thousands of women across Scotland will have been watching online and will be dismayed, actually, at the turn of events. So I do think Parliament itself owes an apology to the many women who have been looking to see what Parliament's view on the Cumberland report is going to be. I am very conscious of that, that point, Mr Carlo. I heard all of the debate. It was an extremely emotional debate as well as a powerful one. And, I'm, and the, the very fact that the vote itself is very close uh, is an important matter. It, you're absolutely right. The business managers, the members and the public also need to have confidence in this parliament and its institutions and its uh, procedures. And that's why we'll return to this matter tomorrow. And I, I fully accept that point. Daniel Johnson. On a point, point of order, order. Presiding officer, uh, under rule 11.7, at three, it states that if it appears that the, to the presiding officer that the electronic voting system has produced an unreliable result, he shall ask members to cast their votes again in accordance with any manner of voting the presiding officer considers appropriate. Now, my reading of that is that because there is doubt that we need to rerun the vote as you have described may be possible tomorrow, but in so doing, 
We th therefore have to declare the previous result and the numbers declared as null and void. And I think that's the clarification that Mr Finlay was asked about. And I was wondering if you could confirm that now. Mr Johnson is absolutely right, which is why we are going to return to this matter tomorrow to make that decision. And I will make that decision tomorrow in the light of knowing exactly what happened in that vote. So Mr, Mr. Johnson is right. Now, can members accept that we will return to this matter this vote has not yet been approved or agreed, and that we will now end, if I can, by putting a further question. This question, if it comes to division, we will move the, the division tomorrow. However, the question is that motion 22484, in the name of Kate Forbes, on the Period Products Free Provision Scotland Bill financial resolution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Okay, on that matter, we are going to... Uh, move to the next item of business, which will be a member's uh, business. I will just allow a few moments for members to clear the chamber and other members to come in for the members' debate. Thank you.